Hi and welcome back to our open stop motion film project. Uh, the system crashed just before I should get on, so we kind of have to get used to that. It's happened quite often, I think. But uh, we are going so uh, as. Uh, as we were yesterday, we are making grease, and uh, we need to get this one finished. And I, of course, didn't get that much made today that I wished for, but I had my granddaughter visit visiting me, so that's how it goes. And we were making dollhouse and but she would not be on video today so we were not streaming it but we will do that later but now it's it's this we are concentrating on <coughs> this old oak and where is my mouth do I have any yes here and I am listening to to it live. It's <coughs> running Windows 10. Uh, Does that thing come with Windows 10? Oh, Windows 2. Does it come uh, with Windows 10 desktop, whatever uh, they call that? This week in Windows. And could it come with either, rock could and Windows uh, 10 Mobile run on Intel? Or is Foley. it only available on our platform so. devices? Uh, you know, how, what's the, how do we break down right. this stuff? Great um, podcast. So easily answerable questions. <laughs> no, they are not. But but we do, I am, I if am you pretty are sure taking Windows first. 10 Mobile will run on Intel and ARM-based small tablets. And I kind of um, is. But Microsoft has, has, they've said it'll run on small tablets. I think in some slides and some various shows, they've said Intel and ARM. Um, but you, Paul, you had a thing. I, I remember, I read so many things when I came and back. But helps. you said something yeah. about when Windows 8.1's purchase Ooh. was... No, Windows 8.1 with Bing is on a mini yep. tablet that you're going to be upgraded I go to Windows easier. 10 desktop. When you have something to That's listen right. to. That's right. And, and we cannot play music. That, I think. Um, play so this. if you have that particular SKU uh, and you're background. one of the people who's looking for this free upgrade, you're not going to get Windows 10 mobile even though you're on a very small tablet. You're going to get You don't even get that desktop. choice. So don't here's why. It's why? because of the way it's licensed. Um, uh, Windows 10 mobile is not something you could buy as an upgrade uh that's if it right. were then you would be able to get that you could only get it on a device and it's serviced differently and this kind of goes back to the one windows thing where it's not really one windows because you know these things are different and um i i think that a lot of people with an hp stream 7 just use that as the obvious example because I, the way i understand it is a year from now most likely that would come with windows 10 mobile. In the future, when you get a brand new SKU, it'll be right. the mobile. I mean, I, I think we would all agree that that kind of device, even sure. an 8-inch device, frankly, would be probably better served for most people for not to have a desktop, even as right. an option. You know, they yeah. shouldn't even be there. Yeah. Um, and so I, I do think that HP Stream 7, you know, 2016 edition, whatever, uh, yeah. will be Windows 10 mobile based and will be Intel. Okay. Um, these branches are a little you know, thick, so they are a little cheap. heavy too. Yeah. Uh, the desktop is really tiny. You get little, you know, you can't, <laughs> you can't do anything. Really hard to stupid. see. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I. It's a very strange kind of thing. And then, I, I, and then, you know, look. I mean, a PC like the ones that we're using today, like traditional laptops, or desktops, whatever. Windows 10 desktop makes plenty of sense. The really small devices. I think you know, Windows 10 mobile makes plenty of sense. I think this area in the middle is the interesting part, though, too, because yeah. you Service Pro 3 with continuum and tablet mode and then you you unclip the keyboard and now it's in like a, it's like tablet os and you clip it back and yeah. now it's like a pc os you know 
um, how people react to that functionality and how well it works uh, is going to do a lot a lot to you know determine how successful Windows 7 is 10 and what is what I said 7 yeah. 7 10 what do you care what do you know? 7 10 it's some number and, uh, <laughs> some number <laughs> but not 9 Nine. Anything but nine. 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 Yes, it's uh, So, we'll see. Will consumers have choice? I mean, will you be able to look at one eight-inch tablet and, and decide? Well, the, the breaking point is eight inches. And so, if yeah. you have an eight-inch tablet, yeah. you get Windows 10 desktop. You just oh, do okay. it. There's no choice. I mean, you can run it in, in a tablet mode. Everything's full screen, but the desktop is still there. And, and, and uh, that tablet, you could dock. You could uh, plug in a keyboard, and it would kind of turn into a computer like PC, right? Uh, but I don't think most people want to do that, and so I actually, I, I just, I, I sort of wish that Windows 10 Mobile was more broadly available. I think is the maybe the big point here that it apparently will be. <coughs> yeah. Another sign. <laughs> oh, I love this show because I learned so much. <laughs> really? Because all we do really is raise questions. <laughs> We do know something about the usage of a Windows phone. Yeah. Where did this come from? This is from Ad, uh, from I say, Ad Duplex, you know, every month comes out with the use of stats. This is not Windows phone usage compared to Android and iOS. It's, it's usage of particular phones within the Windows phone ecosystem. And not a lot changed this month. You know, it's 96 point something percent Nokia slash Microsoft devices. Huge percentage running on Windows 8, the Windows Phone 8 Plus, which is actually pretty good news from an upgrade perspective. And by the way, very different from what we've seen in Android. Um, low end phones rule. There isn't a phone on there. But tomorrow I have more time. Phone. It's a high end phone that's in the top so, six uh, ever. Can, and there aren't any phones sold up the past I didn't years. get any in the top ten at all. thing in the and printer. So, I Windows Phone usage oh. by and large is low, low end devices. Um, and related to that Microsoft just released a new low end Windows phone. I would like 70 bucks. to have yeah. that to run. Well, they don't. You, you haven't tried it, have you? No, the last three one the phones that they've announced, the 430, the 532, 432, I don't remember the numbers anymore, whatever they are. Um, no, I've not tried it. I watched phones. the one they sent me, the, what is it, 635? 635 is a good one. Yeah. It's not, I mean, it's yeah. not, I mean, it's a low It's missing phone. a couple of things. I, my understanding, and I don't know if you got the new, I, my understanding is there might be a new version coming with one gig of RAM. Um, I, don't, I, I have a, look, a I bigger know. problem with some of the proximity sensor missing type stuff like that. You know, some basic sensors that are missing. This new low end phone is the first uh, Microsoft slash Nokia device to have a, a truly abysmal, like sub five megapixel camera, which is I just unprecedented. But I guess you got to save money in some ways. But I mean, it has a gig of RAM, which is smart, and it eight gigs of internal storage, not four, which is really good. But I mean, the the main camera is two megapixels. You know, that's crazy for a, for yeah. a Lumia device. That's never happened before. But, you know, you have to save money, so. Shall we move on to uh, more Shall. Win Heck China tidbits? Oh, man, this is like a back-to-back -back all me. <laughs> I'm sorry. All I you, like... Paul. I can, do, I can do the first one if you want. Go yeah, for it. Go for it, Mike. Yeah. This, so Don Box, we, we mentioned him earlier in the show. He's he's a guy who's been at Microsoft forever. He's a distinguished engineer, and he's been kept totally in the dark from us lately. I'd say for the past, like, four years even. He, he moved over to the Xbox team, and we never heard from him publicly again. And now they're start, starting to let Don Box speak again. And this is great, because Don Box always has a lot of really great tidbits when he when he talks and he shares a lot of things that we know, we need to know and somebody has to say them. One of the things he said at WinHack China when he was talking was that Microsoft has come up with a replacement term for Metro style apps. You know how uh, they couldn't use the word Metro anymore? We were calling them Metro styles. Then we started calling them universal apps. But Don said at WinHack China that they are going to be called Windows apps which I, I heard a lot of people hating on this idea too, but you know what? Universal apps in the Microsoft world, they mean Windows apps. That's what it means. It doesn't mean universal apps going across all platforms. It means apps 
Windows Store apps that are just for Windows. So they're going to call those Windows apps, he says, and they're going to call what we've been calling Win32 apps Windows Desktop apps. I actually like this naming convention. I know there are going to be haters for it, but now at least we have a way of referencing this when we talk about it moving forward. So let's hope Don is speaking for the whole company when he said this, but he, he <laughs> well, did say this publicly. Two, two things I would just add is, uh, one, uh, the actual app platform you refer to is really, as you kind of alluded to, Windows universal apps, right, to differentiate them from truly yeah. generic uh, universal apps. Oh, right. um, he also very specifically described Win32 apps, you know, desktop apps again and again as legacy. Yes, we still support this on desktop PCs only because, you know, we have to and there, there are decades of, you know, uh, background there and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, just to be clear, to, you know, because people like, oh, the, you know, the Metro Modern, but everything failed and we're moving on. It's like, not exactly. I mean, like everything else in Windows 10, this Windows app platform, the Windows universal app platform is really just an evolution of Oops. Metro, of modern. It's that really just the next gen of that. It is yeah. an evolution. It's not a new thing. It's not, uh, yeah, we're going back to the desktop. You know, I mean, for all the desktop orientation of what Microsoft's been talking, Windows 10 is talking. Go look, go see it for yourself on Gen 9. Yeah. That very, very much de-emphasizes the desktop. I mean, it's it's spoken to as a something we're bringing along as we have to, but that's not, we're, we're not advancing it. We're not, you know, we're more with that. It's all universal apps or Windows apps. That's all you have to say? It's all on that item. Developers, yeah. oh no, wait a minute. Uh, edge gestures. Track, uh, yeah. So these two, these two go together. Track, 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 edge track, track, New UIs in Windows 10. This is this has been amazing to me. And I, and I you know what, the, the, I don't know why this is amazing to me because I see this everywhere. Universally, virtually universally. Everyone hated Windows 8, right? Except for one thing those people that didn't. <laughs> and so, <laughs> in, in Windows 10, they're changing all of the edge gestures and the precision trackpad gestures, um, which are related, right? And the reason they're doing that is because the, the functionality you see when you do things on the edges of the screen uh, is different because they've gotten rid of UIs that used to be in Windows 8. So you, Windows 8 has a had a, a switcher UI for switching between apps. It had a charms UI for accessing you know, system uh, menu items, essentially. And then it had that UI to accommodate that ellipsis thing we were talking about earlier, where there are app bars, but they're hidden by default in Windows 8, which is just a crazy way to do it. It's like, you know, imagine if you ran Word for the first time and it came up as a blank window and there were no toolbars at all, and you were wondering, you know, where, where's the save button and where's all the stuff? Oh, we hide them by, by default. It's hilarious. And, and, and to display them, you have to know the special, you know, code, which would be if you have a mouse, you right click it, or if you have a touch screen, you swipe in from the bottom of the screen. It's all changing in Windows 10. And you would think, and I should say there are associated gestures that go with the trackpad as well that are all changing for the same reasons. You would think that the world would just celebrate this, that there would be people partying in the street. We have banished the witch that is Windows 8. And you know what? The truth is, no. There are people who really like how Windows 8 worked with regards to tablets especially. And they think that what's happening in Windows 10 is a step back and a mistake. And they want Microsoft to go back and put charms back in and Put the edge gestures back in, and they want it to work the way that they're used to. And I am fascinated by this because I just spent the last three years dealing with which is Windows 8 hate, 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 hate from all quarters. And now, of course, what comes out of the woodwork is some people like the way it works. Of course, they do. <laughs> like that shouldn't be surprising. Mary Joe, you look like you just saw something horrific. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having all these weird Skype things happen right now. <laughs> oh, it's not its not what he's saying. It's just, well, you look great. I'm seeing everything Jim. pixelated. No, it was like, a, uh, it was like, like when someone's robots. reacting in a bar and it kind of freeze frames. It's like, <laughs> it'll get better. As they say, it gets better. And, or Skype oh, crashes. Sure. <laughs> or, or it doesn't. It'll get better. It'll get better. <laughs> Is that better? Um, How's that? Yes. Yeah. No, kind of. It's probably you, but it could be me. Is it me? It's not you, it's me. Can we just it be friends? It sounds better now. Okay, good. I don't know what's happening. But <laughs> um, 
of course, people are going to raise holy hell, aren't they? When you change the gestures and everything, that's going to make people nuts. The thing is, like, not very many people are using those systems. Even though they right? exist. Right. Yeah. And, you know, like I said earlier, they were not discoverable. Not that that matters if you've discovered them. And you like them, you know? That's the I mean, problem. I, I look at, yeah, I look at what they're doing in Windows 10, and I think it makes sense. Um, I and really I say like that, Windows 10. I love the notification yeah. bar. Those, I, I'm just loving it. Yeah. It's but so much better. I think it is better for the majority of people. Uh, and, you know, with Windows, if you think back to Windows 8, the stuff I would have said about Windows 8, I mean, Windows 8 to me was kind of hilarious, you know, because it was, it was so weird that a, a company as conservative as Microsoft would do something that's nuts. And uh, they were clearly barreling down this track at 900 miles an hour, and, and all we could do was just kind of hold on and let it happen. And so, you know, my advice at the time was, you know, Windows 8's kind of inevitable. You'd better just get the, used to the way it works and... and you know, we can complain about it, and then eventually we can buy these third-party utilities to kind of fix some of it, and that's a good thing. But, you know, it's, you can't really fight reality, you know. And then, of course, with Windows 10, um, they're changing it because everyone complained about Windows 8, right? But not everyone, because, like I said, I mean, some of these people, I don't know, they really miss the way Windows 8 works. It's interesting. Uh, I guess there are fans for everything. Developers, developers, developers. <laughs> Where have we heard that before? Longer, yeah, come on, baby. Uh, Windows 10 SDK is now available. That's good news. Yeah, yeah that was kind of a surprise, even. Um, I, I think a lot of people thought we weren't going to see that until build. Um, so this is the preview version of the Windows 10 SDK, plus some other Windows 10 developer tools came out earlier this week and uh, you can use them with the latest Windows 10 build and Visual Studio 2015 CTP6 so people are starting to poke around in the SDK to see what what's in there um, there's a lot of things for developers in terms of how they can um, kind of collect information on what users are seeing and some of the adaptive UX stuff so a lot of the early bits that they that people need to start writing the apps now are are there and people can start building building things for windows 10 when it's out later this summer so that's good that's good yeah azure app yeah. service that's got to be you <laughs> it's me yeah that's me A new azure app service yeah so this isn't even quote new what Microsoft's doing is they're taking three of the existing Azure application development services. Uh, they're taking the thing that's called uh, Azure Websites, they're taking Azure Mobile Services, and they're taking BizTalk Services, which are the BizTalk integration, application integration services that they have now. And they're combining them all into one development uh, service. Uh, the good news for people is it's going to cost the same as just Azure Web Service, uh, Azure Websites does now, so they're reducing the price. And you can use it to build all kinds of apps, web apps, mobile apps, business apps, what they call logic apps. Um, so it's, it's just meant to make things easier and cheaper, supposedly, for people who want to build apps that run on Azure. Good. Out as of this week as a Good. trial, I think. Take that, Facebook. Yeah. Yep. There. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Take that. Take that. That's it. Uh, let us uh, take a break. Come back with the back of the book because we're almost done. Yep. Did you have any good beer? And mostly bad beer, but one really? very good one I'll tell you about. Okay. Um, <coughs> really? So you were in Vietnam part. and Cambodia, right? Right. Thai beer is supposed to be good. I don't know. You know, it, all these beers are very light lagers yes, because yeah, they're yeah. meant to be it's with hot. really spicy food right. in hot climates. Yeah. So there's nothing that fantastic yeah. about them. Yeah. yeah, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get chocolate porter. No, <laughs> no. no. Yeah, right. No one would drink it. Our uh, our show today is uh, brought to you by a fine company. Perhaps you've heard of them called Nitro. I've been talking a lot about them. This is. Uh, this is kind of your alternative to the really, truly horrible Adobe, Adobe Acrobat. Um, for individual users, for large enterprises, 
Uh, I love Nitro. I've started using it, and uh, I just it's got all the features I want in uh, both PDF Reader, but also PDF Creator and the PDF Editor. You can view, you can create, you can prepare and sign PDF files. I love the, uh, just as an example, man, this really, I just, I don't know why, but this really hit me so nicely. Uh, so I like to, one of the main things I do with PDFs is add a signature. You know, people send me a document and I have to sign it. And, um, of course, they have, you know, a, a signature stamp I can use uh, in Nitro. But the way you get the signature in is so awesome. So you can, uh, you can actually, I sign with a mouse. If that, that, in many cases, that's all. It doesn't really matter. You can uh, import an image if you have one. Or you can, and this is what I did, and I love it. You can sign a card, hold it up to the computer's camera. It will scan it and turn it, and, and now you've got your signature. It's awesome. And it looks great, and you can, you know, it's transparent. It, no, it really works well. Um, or, and they have a signature font you can use, too. One-click PDF conversions to any Microsoft Office format. And back again, completely round trip. You can add text anywhere in a PDF document, even if it doesn't have fields. Um, you can easily connect and host documents in the Nitro Cloud, allowing you to com securely complete transactions with legally binding e-signatures. That's nice. It's easy to make PDFs. They have a virtual printer driver that lets you print to PDF. They've got the Cloud and the Pro. Mm -hmm. and there's so many interesting things, and boy, a lot of big companies use these. Take this. Uh, it is kind of like the ultimate in uh, PDF editing and creation tools. And it, with, it uses a ribbon, so it's very familiar. It really integrates beautif beautifully with Office. You can transform any scanned document or image into searchable, editable PDF with their excellent OCR software built in. It's great for collaboration with markup and re review tools. About half a million businesses, including half of the Fortune 500, are using Nitro. I want you to try it. Go Nitro. G-O-N-I-T-R-O dot com. Slash Twit to learn more about Nitro and their document solutions. And as a special offer for fans of Twit, get that free trial for 14 days. You do not need to give them a credit card. Try Pro or Cloud. You'll love it. Nitro. G O N I T R O dot com. Go Nitro dot com slash Twit. I know many of you have been looking for an alternative to uh, Adobe's products. I've tried them all. This is a great one. Go Nitro dot com slash it's when I use that. <coughs> All Windows machines. Paul Therat, time for your tip of the week, my friend. What? Why are you shaking your head? I had all this stuff running. I... Oh, Mary Jo's gone, so I think you have to take over the show. She's gone. Well, okay. we'll call her back. I, something's going on with it. So, last week, uh, Microsoft added one note, uh, sorry, one drive integration to Xbox Music, which I'm sure we discussed. We mentioned show. it. You have all your music there. You were prescient, you were prepared. Yeah, so that was kind of cool, and, and so, you know, since then I've been experimenting with how this works, and it actually works really well, but um, there's a neat feature on Windows Phone 8.1 that, uh, that had been there already. In fact, I was, I, it's easy to miss. I, when I initially saw Microsoft discussing this today, I misunderstood what they were saying, but um, if you had an Xbox Music <laughs> in the past, you could sync your playlist on Windows Phone so that as the playlist was updated, those updates would always come down to your phone, meaning you could keep them offline. So if you were on a plane or whatever, you could listen to them. And so that feature has been updated to support OneDrive-based music as well. So instead of just going into a playlist and selecting the songs or selecting the whole playlist and saying, you know, let's bring it down, you know, down to the phone and I'll have it on the phone, you can actually check a box in settings. It's kind of hidden that will keep that thing synced so that as it's updated, the new songs will also be synced to the phone as well. So I've got, it's mentioned in an article here, but uh, basically just go and look at the playlist, go into settings. By the way, using that tiny ellipsis menu we were mentioning earlier, you know, hit the ellipsis settings and there's a chance the box uh, for keeping that thing synced up. And so that's kind of a neat thing to do if you're using Windows Phone like I am uh, and uh, Xbox Music. And then the software pick this week is uh, Windows 10 built uh, t uh, 10, how do we say this? Uh, Ten thousand forty-one, um, which you know shipped last week to the fast ring. Cramp in my uh, Only an upgrade form, but is now available to so uh, slow ring folks, but also an ISO form. And so, I, I I had spent some time last week investigating and then starting to write a tip about how you could use the upgrade files that Microsoft gave you to create your own ISO and then do these clean installs off an ISO. 
But the more I got into it, the more I realized this is a really temporary solution. It's not worth the effort. And then sure enough, uh, exactly a week later, they released the ISO. So if you've been holding off and doing a clean install on this uh, because you couldn't before, now you can. Uh, just grab the ISOs. They're available for free uh, from the Windows website. That's, that's the easiest way to do it, I guess. Especially on multiple machines. If you have the ISO, you just put it on a USB key or something. I find it so much. I mean, for yeah. VM installs especially. Oh, yeah. You, you, just want want to, those, yeah. you want the clean install. You don't want to yeah. do it. Yeah. Well, in fact, I use the ISO to get started, and then did, I've been doing upgrades since then. Yeah. But you, can just, you know, but if you haven't done it yet, you can, you right. can start right. It's the best way. Yeah, you need it, actually. Yep. Um, code name. Pick, oh, Mary Jo Foley, I hear a sigh. She's back. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. I see it. Is there a connection I, problem? I, I I'm see back. I, do you guys see me okay? Yeah. 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 Go, just quickly talk fast. Give okay. us a couple of code yeah. names before you fail. Yes. <laughs> I know, I keep, I keep losing my Skype connection. I don't know why. Well, they um, thought you weren't in town, so they turned off your internet. I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. The, First, super, the super came yeah. in and turned off the heat and heated it. Ah. <laughs> it's the first day of spring, the heat goes up. Exactly. You know. Yep. Um, first pick of the week is both an enterprise pick and a code name pick. Double win. Um, the code name is Tuva. T-U-V-A. Where, what is Tuva? Does anybody know? Well, yes. Is it a place? It's <laughs> where the Tuvan throat singers come from. Oh, you were doing that at the start of the show. It's weren't kind you? of a weird coinky dink. I was. <laughs> it is. Nee, 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 so, nee, 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 nee. Tuva. It's like near Tibet. Is, oh, is it? Okay. I think so. huh, interesting. Tuva, according to some tipsters of mine, is the code name for that Windows Server 2016 Nano Server that we heard some leaks about a couple months ago. Um, so the Nano Server is a very stripped down version of Windows Server that's made, um, what did they say, made for the modern web or something, um, that it's going to not include roles as part of it and that it's meant for people to use kind of in a minimalized way um, so the, all I know now that I didn't know then is the code name for that is Tuva. So uh, that makes yeah. me believe that leaked slide deck that told us there was going to be a nano server is in fact valid. It's uh, in the Russian Republic. It lies just in is South, it? Oh, South it's Siberia. Siberia. Oh. But yeah, it's uh, the Tuvan okay. throat singers come from the, tu the Tuvan homeland. Yeah, the homeland of the Tuves. Tuves? <laughs> I don't think they're the Tuves. <laughs> I just okay. made that up. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> uh, it's the geographic center of Asia. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'll play some uh, Tuvan throat singing when you do your beer pick. Okay. <laughs> you, I you think we need... Uh, One more you have a code name. I'm sorry. Yeah. So that was the Enterprise slash first code name pick. And the second pick is a I cannot. pure code name pick of the week. Yes. It's called Project no. Milky Way. Um, this is another gem from the WinHack China slide My deck. Head. Neo Win is the one that I uh, saw publish this. Uh, Project Milky Way, they, there's a slide that says the goal is to, quote, delight users by keeping their mobile devices updated with the latest release Oops. within four to six weeks of when we release it. Oh, we true. Uh, as we know, as Windows Phone users, this has not always been the case. Microsoft releases stuff, and we get it months or years later. So we're hoping that this Project Milky Way is a way that Microsoft is trying yeah, to put a little more sticks pressure in this on and mobile and operators, uh, maybe, and the play. handset makers to say, it would be really good if you guys would do more frequent updates. We're going to make them available more frequently. We hope you will make them available to users more frequently. That's hilarious, by the way. But I'm sorry. Yeah. They were going to call it Project <laughs> Snickers, but uh, they said... Exactly. Just the, the notion that after all these years, we're going to work on the good intentions of the wireless carriers. Is, <laughs> we yeah. know better than that. That's amazing. We know Maybe that's why that. it's like Milky Way, like something sweet that you would love to have happen, but... That's something we're never going to reach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that could be it, too. <laughs> so I... Aspirational. I was hoping yeah. you would do uh, a delicious beer from uh, Southeast Asia, but <laughs> but there are none. <laughs> instead, I give well, you some well, delicious first, singing from Southeast Asia. 
but uh, <laughs> right. yes, you, you, you haven't been Germany. here yet. I have missed them all, and I am not going to miss this That's one. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Because you gave me a heads up, I will make sure to be here. I don't even work Friday, and I'm going to come in just for... Oh, uh, no, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if the excuse is Leo's not here because he doesn't work Friday, <laughs> you know, we'd be... Uh, it's my day off. You were asking me to come in on my day off yeah. to talk about Windows. Sure. And I'm going to... I think it's going to be a great show. I, I think there's going to be a lot of... No, I'm excited. I'm very excited. Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of fun stuff. And I would like to reiterate, I am so far really liking Windows. Windows 10, I cannot wait to hear more. And I yeah, can't wait yeah. to get it on all my Windows PCs. So my friends, we do Windows Weekly normally Wednesdays. Uh, that's 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Mark Zuckerberg permitting. <laughs> 1800 UTC. Um, and uh, we'll be back. <laughs> Zuckerberg, I gotta. He was very, you know what, you should thank him. He wrapped right at 11 so we could do the show. We didn't get That's true. Through. It didn't run long. It did not run long. He was precise and on time. It was less than an hour. We will actually be covering tomorrow's keynote, which will be more interesting. That's going to be the Oculus Rift keynote uh, at F8. Yeah, that'll be fun. 10 o'clock tomorrow morning Pacific time. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mary Jo. Paul Therott's at therott.com. That's three T's, a U, a couple of R's, and an O. Don't forget the number four. And the number four. <laughs> Uh, we love Paul, and we love Paul's new site, therot.com. Everybody should go there. He's at therot on the Twitter. Mary Jo Foley is at allaboutmicrosoft.com. That's the place to go to get the latest Microsoft news. She's also at Mary Jo Foley uh -huh. on the Twitter. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next time. Welcome home, Mary Jo. Thanks. Liz McLeod. Eric Duckman says, thank you, Paul and Mary Jo, although you'll never see this. Because you, you don't go in chat. No. No. I can't. I would just rather be in chat. You it's know, hard, you know, I, it's, I, and I do this every show, but I, I have a it. lot of things. It's very distracting. It's like it when you put a laser light in front of a cat. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's distracting. Yeah. But we are glad that we are glad. Well, we love the chat because that's, you know, that's our community. And, uh, yeah. So I, I relay stuff. That's my job chat you know thank you sir and thank you eric i'm in the interlocutor chat interlocutor thank you guys thanks see ya bye. Bye. bye yeah it's not the same without mary joe is it love mary joe the two of them that's the team i need though uh a title for this fine more and more like AOL, Dagamar suggests. <laughs> Doing moonshots, uh, a credible Hail Mary. <laughs> Interlocutor. I N T E R L O C U T E R. It's the it's an old term. Uh, Windows now free. <laughs> Bang, zoom, Zuckerberg. Back from Nam. <laughs> like that. <laughs> Fritos. Don't worry, be merry. There wasn't anything really that leapt out, was there? Sometimes there is. Sometimes there isn't. <laughs> I love the smell of M's in the morning. Steal this OS. <laughs> At least you got the roof rats. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> pack from Nam. <laughs> really? Should I do that? <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is Windows Weekly with Paul Thorat and Mary Jo Foley. Episode 406, recorded Wednesday, March 25th. 2015. Back from Nam. That's apostrophe N A M. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Nature Box. Nature Box ships great tasting snacks right to your door. Start snacking smarter with wholesome, delicious treats like dark chocolate pretzel pops. Oh, man! Uh, to get your complimentary Nature Box sampler, visit naturebox.com slash twit. Where do I get some of those dark chocolate pretzel pops? Nature. I'm going to do it again. I really got, I, I, it's, I just like, tip me away. 
Windows Weekly is brought to you by NatureBox. NatureBox ships great tasting snacks right to your door. Start snacking smarter with wholesome, delicious treats like dark chocolate pretzel pops. <laughs> to get your complimentary NatureBox sampler, visit naturebox.com slash twit. That's naturebox.com slash twit. Yeah, we should recall it Microsoft Weekly, shouldn't we? And we should. And by Casper, an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the price. Because everyone deserves a great night's sleep. Get $50 off any mattress purchased by visiting casper.com slash windows and entering the promo code windows. And by Nitro. Nitro accelerates the way businesses create, prepare, and sign PDF files anytime, anywhere, saving you and your business time. To learn more and try it free for 14 days, visit GoNitro.com slash twit. That's GoNitro.com slash twit. It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Thorat's here. Yes, Mary Jo Foley is back from her trip to Vietnam and Cambodia. Uh, and it's going to be a great Windows Weekly. We've got a lot of parsing. You've got a lot of parsing to do. Stay tuned. Windows Weekly, the reunion episode is next. You've got a lot of parsing to do. All right, this week in Google coming up. Jeff Jarvis, Mike Elgin. We're trying to get Danny Sullivan. But uh, do you guys want pictures before you go? You want to get a picture back here sitting on the ball? We'll get a uh, an intern or an employee of some sort out to take the picture. I'm going to get the funny hats. Oh. Gosh, I'm creaky. Creaky. Can you help me, Johnny? Johnny B? Help me, Johnny B. God, I missed you. Now, get on the ball. Yeah, get all the way up to that keyboard. Get on the ball. I'm going to give you a hat. That looks like a large head. It is. Very few of our viewers have small heads. Big. <laughs> That's as big as we get. <laughs> Great, you can now free your family from Thank you, Leo. Outlet Mall Hill. Wherever he thanks, thanks to meet you. Thanks for coming. Do you want a picture too? No. No? Good. Makes it easy on me. Isn't that awesome? Uh, that that uh, actually came from some uh, Welsh fans. Yeah, you saw me wear that. I have a very, my hat collection has really blossomed, literally. Gosh, that didn't take long. Thank you. 
It's really blowing outside tonight. The wind is strong. I hope it'll stop to the weekend when we are on Easter holiday. Oh man, I'm looking forward to that. be so nice. After a whole winter sitting in here and making this stuff. Someone should actually send you a living meerkat. I think that would be awesome. That's fine. They're cute. Until they gouge your eyes out. Yeah. And then they're well. less cute. And you can't see them. Exactly. Should I meerkat uh, twig chat room? So what? It's Google and the cloud. Meerkat is the cloud. Okay. On mine. Really. <clears throat> Where is that? That is here. <clears throat> exactly, Odor. 
actually with an, it is an iPhone specific app, um, and you can fold an iPhone six. At least you can bend it. Above the bend. Which I thought was way too big. This backwards. And do like this. Because I keep running into it with my chair. Yes. Very nice. almost April. Hmm? I know. It's, Christmas is going to be here soon. Oh, sorry. Shut up. Exposed spring. Mm. That's the best part. Hi -ho. Hi -ho. Hello. Hello, Jeffrey Jarvis. Hello. Do, do, so I, didn't, I didn't do this to you, but I have Skype running on my Chromebook. It looks so good. How did you do that? No, I'm not. I'm not. On, I'm on the back now. It looks so good. What did you do? How did you get Skype running? 
I'll just have a show. There's a guy on the rundown. There's a guy named uh, Gary Judge. Name. Who taught how to do it via as an Android app. Yep. Yeah. Twerk. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. I haven't done that working yet. So yeah, you can run you can run Android apps uh, on the so, You know, it's funny. After putting Crouton on and stuff, I just power washed it all the way. I like. <coughs> yeah. It's it's just great. It's, it is it. fast, wonderful. Machine. Isn't it fast? You got your LS. And, you know, I was having videos go slow with me on my old one, and, and I, not this one. I know. And that Verge thing, the, the scrolling, none of it. It's all, it's all lickety-split. <laughs> this week, an old white, white guy's on Google. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mike's here. Mike's I'm, not an old white guy. I'm not that white. He's a young black man. Can't you tell? It's not that, I'm not that white. He's tan. Vaguely pinkish. <laughs> Today we're in Vegas. Mm. Since we last spoke. Yeah, for uh, Debbie's birthday. It was a fun time. And now I'm back. And I uh, apologize for not being able to get you into Google I.O., but if, I think if we... That's, this happened last year and we whined, right? Uh, uh, yeah, and I tried... I've tried whining directly with Eddie and responded to my emails. Talk to Gina, Jeff. Talk she to get Gina. in? She got in um, with a nine, you know, with a, a paid ticket, but she oh. can't go. Oh, well, ask her for uh, a ticket. She said, "Who do you know uh, that might want this?" Do I don't know? even, I don't even know if it's transferable. But oh, uh, it may not be. It no, might not be, but it isn't. Uh, let Gina know, um, and I can send her an email as well. So we try to get Danny Sullivan, he's been doing great uh, stuff yeah. on that uh, FTC report, but I take it both of you have yes. are up on it. I think that's probably going to be the big topic of the day today. We have two ads, Legal Zoom, offer code TWIG, and HipChat, offer code TWIG. Switch over to my ads bucket here, Legal Zoom, there we go. Uh, offer code TWIG, and then HipChat.com. Hey Jeff, turn that off now, or uh, take a lunch break, please. I'm I'm really done with the meerkat. Not on co- not on not on company time, please. Not on company time, and not and in fact, I'm gonna ban it in the studio. Please, no more. You can do it at home. Thank you. <sighs> um, I'm ready when you are. I am. Let me make sure I'm recording in three different places, which I am. Okay, good to go. Oh yeah, Jeff. <laughs> so he said, "Does Jeff need to be pushed up to the table?" Yes, you need to. You need to join. Join the crowd. Oh, oh, I say. Oh. <laughs> uh, how's that? Is that better? Wasn't he kind of far away? Oh, I, I don't need to see him. I know what he looks like. <laughs> He's a little bright. That's the only thing I would say. Not, not in real life, on camera. Can you show the wide? See how, see how I know he's blown. definitely bright in see how that blown he is on that. He's fine on the normal shot. Jeff yeah, very bright. I've actually dialed it down on the normal shot. Cause Should I adjust my camera? No, no, no. No, no, no. Okay. no, no. Yeah, it's just a TV thing. I do it all the time in the other studio. Everybody's a little different, so the TV I sometimes I'll change the settings. It's funny when I get out of the shower, it sticks straight up. I look 
That's really strange. <laughs> <laughs> Only took one fiscal quarter. One fiscal quarter? No. I know our brand is, but, but Jeff has a job that does not include meerkatting 24-7. So, eight hours a day. I just want eight hours a day. That's all I ask. It's time for Twig this week in Google, the show that covers Google, the cloud, Facebook, Twitter, all that jazz. Jeff Jarvis is here, CUNY. Professor, actually, he's from his home. I don't like jazz. You don't like jazz? No, I'm not a jazz. Gosh, you look like somebody would go, you know, just, to uh, I know, I'm not the a West jazz. Village, the Village Vanguard. None of that jazz. None of that jazz. No, none of that jazz. Don't tell my, me you're my, dubstep. I don't know what it is. Good. My, my my notional Jeff Jarvis is intact, sort of. When I when I ran parts. EW, I I tried to ban jazz. I what? Haughty. Oh, just just to be troubled too. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, welcome, Jeff. He's the author of uh, What Would Google Do? Public Parts, his latest geeks bearing gifts, yes. which I have in the other room. I should bring it so I can hold it up, because of course Jeff doesn't have a copy. He can. Good to have you, Jeff. Also with us, Mike Elgin, our news director. And uh, Mike and I this morning got up. Well, you didn't get up. You actually, I guess you did. Cause you I got up the, the usual time. The usual time, which is like 3 in the morning or some ungodly hour. And I like jazz. And in fact, I have a, a quick would. recommendation. I, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, a, a quick recommendation, a movie, there's a movie called Whiplash. Is that good? It's very good. Of course, Oscar nominated, and it's, I think he won an Oscar. Somebody won an Oscar. It's very good, and it'll, it'll give you an appreciation for jazz. They they emphasize the sadistic qualities of sort of band leading yeah. uh, and, and instruction and so on. But it's a great movie, and it's, there's a lot of great jazz in it. So. It's a high school jazz band, right? It's, uh, I think it's college, it college level. Okay. Uh, it's like a, a New York Academy of some kind. And, yeah, it's a great movie. And, it's, and it's of really course, J.K. Simmons uh, is the yes. star of that. Yep. We, we love him from his uh, insurance company ads. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's a little disconcerting to see a guy who I remember for insurance company ads on the Oscar yep. s- stage. But yes. You can do everything these days. Yep. It's no longer a stigma to do an ad. So uh, the, I think easily the big story uh, today is, uh, is this thing that the Wall Street Journal has been reporting. The FTC, and we reported this at the time, uh, a couple of years ago, investigated Google and, de- and ended up deciding not to uh, prosecute them. Uh, but now uh, the details from the FTC investigation have been leaking out on the Wall Street Journal. I guess the Journal got it. Did they get it in a FOIA request? Uh, uh, they, they made a FOIA request. The FTC accidentally sent them the 160 page report, then said, Oops, can we have it back? And the Journal said, No. Too late. Freedom of Information Act. So uh, the staff report apparently was a little bit more um, negative about Google. Mind um, you, there are two reports. There's a staff report and there's an economist report. Okay, well, staff report is lawyers. Economist report worries about uh, impact on the economy and on consumers. And it's, uh, they're different. And I do, you know, you can read it on the journal, but I think Danny Sullivan has been doing a marvelous job at marketingland.com. We actually tried to get him from the show. He's not available. Parsing the report. And apparently, the journal's only publishing every other page. Is that right? It's some weird thing where, yeah, he has he has every other page. And then he says the and footnotes then, so are tying footnotes stuff together. To go back to other pages. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's lots of juice in it. Uh, search there engine is land. And there is. Well, there is okay. There is. This is why I thought it would be a good conversation no. for this show, because the impression that you get from the Wall Street Journal article is. Well, the FTC should have prosecuted um, and that went easy on Google and that there's plenty of smoking guns. Is that not your sense? Well, from the Wall Street Journal, absolutely, and the Wall Street Journal, I mean, let's, let's keep in mind here, and I, I, you know, I, I said at the end of the piece that I wrote about this, I wish Google would F up more so I could criticize them more, because I don't want to be <laughs> in a position later. defending them too yeah. often. Yeah. And I'm not going to defend them fully on this, but uh, let's keep in mind for context, that, that Rupert Murdoch has had an absolute attack going on against Google. He had Robert Thompson, the head of News Corp, write a screed against Google. Uh, after <coughs> they then went and got the uh, visitor logs from the White House saying, look how often Googlers go and visit the White House. 230 private meetings. 
Yeah, well, I'm going to be surprised. Ah, they're an important company. I'm, I'm sure they're not the only company that had many meetings in the White House. They might have brought T-shirts. You know, I don't know. Yeah. So uh, the the report, and this is the one by the lawyers, yes, labeled them a monopoly and recommended litigation. Is that right? Yes, some, yes, yes. Shortly after the report came out, the FTC decided to close the investigation. But no, they settled it, right? Said, well, they did well, ask there were them some, to change some changes in behavior, yeah. but they, they didn't go on for investigation. And note that it was unanimous across party lines. The journal is trying to hint that there was a political game here. That's why all the meetings at the White House. Hey. Uh, but the, the Washington Post wrote a very good and balanced explanation of what goes on and how in these investigations there are these this two is normal. They come together, this is normal. Yeah. So there is a contingent that often that advocates stronger action than the FTC ends up taking. That doesn't, it's not, it doesn't mean the FTC decided Gosh, to go lawyers easy. like to sue you. Yeah. So uh, Danny Sullivan says, uh, it turns out a vocal contingent inside the FTC wanted stronger action. The report written by the FTC's Bureau of Competition is one of several sets of findings and recommendations. The commissioners then take it all into account. And as you say, the Post says, uh, that, you know, they, uh, somebody's always going to be left out. Not everyone will be handled. They ultimately voted uh, against bringing legal action, although they did say that uh, Google was able to mitigate some of the uh, issues. The report <coughs> Google had abused its market position. Google's conduct has resulted and will result in real harm to consumers and to innovation in the online search and advertising markets. The evidence paints a complex portrait of a company working toward an overall goal of maintaining its market share by providing the best user experience, it's not illegal, while simultaneously engaging in tactics that resulted in harm to many vertical competitors and likely helped to entrench Google's monopoly power over search and search advertising. And this is the thing I've always said was a red flag with Google, was that they're in all of these businesses, Google Local, YouTube, uh, Google Shopping, uh, the, uh, the Google Flight thing, you know, the booking stuff, where they would have a temptation to put their results ahead of competition's results, even if it technically in the search it shouldn't be, if PageRank wouldn't rate, rate them that highly. And that's essentially the fundamental complaint here, right, that they, that, that, that they found evidence that Google had done that. Yeah, well, well the, the, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, you go first. So, so I, I, it's not that clear, especially if you look at Danny Sullivan's um, posts on this, exactly what it is that they found. They found a lot of tweaking. Uh, and um, from what I can gather, first of all, this is from 2007. And at the time, apparently Google was vexed by the fact that product searches for, for product and service oriented uh, results were very poor. The user experience was poor. So for, if you forget about the content, the experience was very poor. They, they were testing these different types of results against, uh, you know, like uh, groups of people and seeing whether they said, okay, I like this result, I don't like that Yeah, result. we'll call these testers the searchers. That's what yes. Danny, the term Danny uses. Exactly. Sounds like a creepy uh, movie. <laughs> you know. These are, but these are, these are other, these are like focus groups. Maybe. Exactly. Focus groups. Exactly. And, and so <clears throat> Google has something called a diversity algorithm. So if, for example, if somebody searches for Leo Laporte, they're going to get all this praise for Leo Laporte, but Google will, so. will go find some criticism of Leo Laporte really? and throw it in there because that makes searchers happy. Be, well, because it it's, it, it it gives it's balance. Your choice. Yeah, exactly. Ah, choice. and so that's not inappropriate, I think. And right? so they were oh. tweaking that. So my guess would be that yes, they they did things that made some of their competitors rank worse, and they probably did things that made some of their competitors rank better than they would have. They're trying to tweak and fudge these numbers so that it looks balanced and gives users a result that makes them think, okay, this is the result that I was looking for. That's where the debate lies. Is you know, Were they doing this to improve search results, or were they doing this to defeat the competition? And now, in one part that, that I read in the Wall Street Journal, uh, it said that Google would go to searchers, searchers would be unhappy with their result. And they would still go Stick with it. With it anyway. Yeah. And so that gives a lie to the idea that they're trying to make better search results. That 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 implies, if I'm just reading that by itself, that Google is acting anti-competitively. Uh, this is what the journal said in a sidebar: how Google skewed search results. Google would automatically boost its own sites for certain specialized searches that otherwise would favor rivals. This is from the FTC. 
If a comparison shopping site was supposed to rank highly, Google Shopping was placed above it. When Yelp was relevant to a user's search query, Google Local would pop up on top of the results page, the staff wrote. Now, Danny points out this is common practice. I don't know if this lets Google off the hook, but this is common practice among search engines. Uh, in fact, he's written many articles that talk about this. He's, he's not in favor of this, but he says this is how search engines uh, work. The thing that's really important, though, in antitrust action and monopoly action is a company that's not a monopoly can get away, can legally do things that a company that is a monopoly cannot. So Microsoft bundles Internet Explorer as a, as a browser because of Microsoft's dominant position in uh, operating systems. The Department of Justice went after them, even though if, you know, Leo's operating system bundled a browser, that would be fine. Or actually, OS X bundled a browser, that would be fine. And it's because of the dominant position. Antitrust law is all about not using your dominant position to enter other markets. And it sounds like that's exactly well. But but here's 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 and I had this argument with somebody at the Guardian on Twitter. Who's to say that Google is it is what it started to be is a search engine? I would define Google as a personal services company, and I would say that it's not entering other markets. It's expanding its service as one would. Uh, you know, McDonald's adds breakfast. It's a restaurant. I would also argue that this is something that always pops up when you talk about the you know the Facebook algorithm. Uh, when they were caught doing experiments on users, uh, people were talking about that Everybody for a while. We don't that. talk about it anymore. Right. But but this this is an example. You can be sure that Google's search group is changing everything every single day. They are tweaking and changing. And, and they admit it. And and they they told in, in a follow-up. Well, they do admit it. Part of their job. That's what they do. But they told Danny that the, the big pro they were trying to solve a specific problem that existed seven years ago. Which was? Which was that the results for when you're looking for things like uh, restaurant reviews and things like that, the results were crap. And they were trying to make the results be something that was um, uh, more appealing to end users. My guess is that uh, the results changed, other companies changed, and they kept tweaking it and changing it. Whether they tweaked it in a way that was anti-competitive in a new way or not, we have no idea. We have no data on that at all. But my guess is that, that this is a moving target. They right. basically got a snapshot of, of some tests that Google were doing at some point, and that didn't sound right. It didn't feel right. It was it seemed anti-competitive, especially if you assume, which I, I, I don't know that they did assume, that it's the, the search results are a set it and forget it thing where you write the algorithm and you walk away and then it's supposed to be fair and blind and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's, of course it's not. It's never going to be the case. In fact, here's Danny, here's Danny quotes his 2008 article that he wrote on how this works. This <coughs> is seven years ago, right about this time frame. He's quoting Marissa Meyer. He says, Marissa Meyer said, the first result in Google might get clicked on more than a third of the time out of all clicks. In other words, that first result is the result that really counts. In fact, Google's search quality team makes it a goal to try to make that first result as relevant as possible. Universal search, well, he goes on to say, in contrast, the one box insertions, those are those boxes on the side, right? Uh, get clicked on less despite getting prime placement on the page since they aren't as relevant. Uh, is, or maybe the one box is the one that's in the search results above the first click. Anyway, universal search, this is his articles about this technique, aims to fix this through something called blending. With universal search, search, Google will hit a range of its vertical search engines, then decide if the relevancy of a result from book search, for instance, is higher than a match from web page search. Overall, now Danny writes, today, what the FTC staff seem to find so damning about Google actually reads like a standard practice to those who know how search engines operate and why they operate the way they do. But then he says, not this part, and this, I th it's not clear, but I think this is from his story in 2008. While Google is it from the, I can't, you know, no, what, Danny. A story, right? The staff said so. It's a okay, story. this is the Wall Street Journal. Maybe it's the journal. Yeah. yeah, this is the journal story. While Google promoted its own results, it sometimes, and this is the key, demoted rivals. The FTC staff found, for example, Google compiled a list of comparison shopping sites that compete with Google Shopping, and demoted them from the top ten web results. Staff wrote. According to the report, and here's what we were talking about with searchers, Google users and tests didn't like those changes. Only after Google tweaked its search algorithm, algorithm at least four times and changed the ranking criteria, 
did the new results get slightly positive feedback? Slightly positive? That's when Google went with it and said, all right, we were able to move the needle a little anyway. Um, I, it's always worried me about Google, and we've always said on this show, we, there's no smoking gun. Keep going. Keep going. Um, that's alarming, Danny writes. Google has consistent. this is his modern article, that has consistently said over the years in various ways, at various times, it doesn't blacklist particular websites for competitive reasons. Yes, sites might get manually penalized or hit with algorithmic penalties for violating Google's spam guidelines. Matt Cutts does this all the time. In fact, that was a big improvement in search results when Matt Cutts stopped linking search results from the search results. And that was a big problem. Remember, you'd get linked right. farms and stuff. But no, Danny writes, Google has said it does not try to wipe out Yelp or Bing or Expedia just because they compete with it in search areas. The Wall Street Journal's article about the FTC staff report suggests evidence this is not the case, that Google indeed actively decided it would demote dem competing sites and did so even though its searchers didn't like it. And there's three postscripts here. Yeah. That's so we talked clear. with the Wall Street Journal reporter, first postscript, uh, Rolf Winkler, about the demotion section. Uh, a scan of the actual footnote covering this on the Wall Street Journal site, but I haven't been able to locate it yet. It sounds like Google may have been doing a test that didn't go out to all searchers at the time, one of improving this diversity that we were talking about in search results. One of the big problems at the time, writes uh, Danny, is that it was common to searches that led back to pages of search results at other sites, which is, as we all agree, a pretty bad user experience. Google even issued a guidance against it guideline remains, although Google pretty much seems to ignore it. So what he's saying is this example. You do a search for uh, buying a product. You click the top result, which actually leads you back to another shopping site, which gives you more of its search results. This is an experience Google says isn't a good experience, and they demoted him for that reason, not because they're competing. Am I reading that correctly? No. And keep going. Okay. Next postscript. Postscript 2. <laughs> I feel like we're in court. I found, Danny writes, where the Wall Street Journal has posted some of the original report it obtained. The section about demoting competing sites is covered in footnote 154. The context to what 154 is covering isn't provided. This is a case where we don't have the, the, the page, but we have the footnote from the page. And by the way, only Danny Sullivan, bless his heart, would go through and find footnote 154. I was watching him at 5 or 6 this morning live. Actually, it was 6 his time. I was at 3 a.m. This, this morning, California time, watching him live tweet this process. Yeah. It was amazing of going back and forth. That, and that's why I really wanted to get him on, but he's probably sleeping. Although Google originally sought to, the, this is the footnote, although Google originally sought to demote all comparison shopping websites after Google Raiders provided negative feedback to such a widespread demotion, Google implemented the current iteration of its so-called diversity algorithm. Google claimed the goal of this algorithm was to increase the diversity of Google's search results for product-related queries. So far, I don't have a problem with that yeah, kind of activity. Zero problem. Right. We don't want and, and to well, search for a companies. product and then get a, a page that's full yes. of searches for a product. Right. But there were companies that, that there was a company, a couple companies have sued Google saying, you've ruined our business. We are a legitimate, uh, you know, index. And Google says, no, you are a... Uh, awful comparison site and just spammy. And this is where I have long, long, long argued that Google is at its most vulnerable because it does indeed hold the power of God over right. these companies. And what I have suggested, nobody pays attention to me, but what the hell, is that Google should have some kind of outside <coughs> commercial peers because it's in the interest of decent companies not to have that crap in search. And somebody, though, has to judge, is this a legitimate company or is this just a crappy comparison site that's just trying to get uh, search juice? And, and it's not sometimes an easy call, and that's where Google is at some vulnerability, and this shows the vulnerability. Yeah, and it's why I've said again and again, Google just shouldn't get any side businesses. No, no, that's where I, no, I'm no, I think you're wrong. But, but uh, there's always going to be, Caesar's wife must be above suspicion. There's but, always but, going to be the suspicion, if Google's in a competing business, that it's going to favor okay. its search results. Is it a competing business to force, to, to, to give me, as I'm using regularly now, flight results directly on Google versus making me go through for Cacta Expedia, which is a pain in the butt. Well, in that, 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 that case, Google provides a better service to me through its direct flight recommendations for which it no, bought a company, and, which is having a competitive fine. impact on the others. I don't have a problem with that. Because it's a search result. 
The search is a vertical search, a flight search, and in fact, when you click the link, you are then sent to the airline. So all it's doing is giving, it's a, that's a form of search. Get into commission. I don't know Here's where I, let's sale. use a, a cleaner example. Yeah, I, I know, but, but, it, but that's a search, but, that's a search function. Let's give you a cleaner example. I search for a video, I search for Twit, a Twit video. I search for This Week in Google, and I get two results. Number one result is our show on YouTube. Number two result is our show on our webpage, let's say. I don't actually know if that happens. The problem is, if that does happen, there's this inevitable suspicion that Google's doing that to promote its own service over my site. In fact, in fact, it, your site comes up first, the Wikipedia yes, entry so comes up second, that. and YouTube comes up No, but third. you search for a show, like, I, I don't know what happens, This week actually. in Google. Yeah. This week in Google, uh, two, three, four. And yet, putting another uh, fly in the we have to personalize search. Huge, we come huge, up first. nice listing. Yeah, YouTube is the third result. And this is one of the problems with, with this criticism or this fear that, that Google is going to favor. It's actually very difficult to, f to do searches and find clearly skewed results. It's, it's yeah, and that's why search, we've... Search on, search on this week in Google, the words. Yeah, But all I'm that. saying is that's why... But, but, but I think it's important. It shows the quality of search. Look, look, yeah, yeah, yeah. search on this week in Google. And that's why I've given them a pass, because in these obvious examples... They've wow, been very, what a nice, yeah. big but Jeff, these are, for these are the obvious examples. And by the way, YouTube is the number two result, which it probably yeah. shouldn't be. But, but nevertheless, you're right. And that's why I've always given it a pass. Okay, as far as I can tell, they've not been, you know, doing that. But now we have a smoking gun. And this, uh, that they are doing it for diversity or whatever. The point is they are, they would be above suspicion if they weren't in YouTube. If they didn't own YouTube, if they weren't in these businesses. That's... But, but uh, I know I'm, it's a it's a private. I used to say, and, and, and so and so so you know you freeze dry a company at one point and say this is what it is. Google, I think, in the long run, is not primarily a search company. Google, as I just said a few minutes ago, is a personal services company. No, I, I value Gmail as much as I value search. No, I understand it's an ad company. So, but this is yes, why there's yeah. some difficulty here, and the easiest way to cut this problem would be just. Not set yourself up in competing businesses. But, but then, no, but then, then you have frozen, you freeze dried the company and, and you put a fence around what it's allowed to do because it's in one business, and you've defined it by that beginning business. That okay, any but that's what antitrust law that's does. What antitrust law says is you cannot use your dominance in one sector to then give you an advantage in other sectors. I don't think here's I don't think they've done that in this case. Let's go to the next case of the FCC, or unless you want to. Continue on. No, no, no. I think uh, enough said. Enough said. No, no. Well, well. I want to go. I want to go to the rest of the MPC thing. But, but, but. There's a Google response in, in Danny's piece right there. Should Postscript three. Yeah. Google sent me some background information now, which I'll summarize as follows. It didn't provide a statement I can actually quote. Just info offered to explain the situation from its point of view. Google said, and this is Danny writing, in 2007, aggregator comparison sites were dominating results for product searches. We remember those bad mm -hmm. old days. Yep. Yeah. And these sites were often of low quality. Uh, I used to use uh, PriceWatch a lot. Yep. In fact, starting in 2000, I used PriceWatch all the time. Now, if I search for an Asus motherboard on Google and it sends me to a PriceWatch search page, that may actually be what mm -hmm. I'm looking for, mm -hmm. but maybe not. And I don't think it's wrong right. for Google to say, well, that's probably not a good result. You want an a to find that ASUS. Basically, you want us to do what PriceWatch is doing yep. and give you a list of places you could buy that ASUS motherboard by price. Um, but but you can also see how the FTC might say, well, that's just you getting in their business. By the way, price, is PriceWatch even around anymore? You'd hate to be in that business if Google's doing it. Even in cases of good quality, Google, again with Danny, Google still felt it was a search issue when people would click from its search results to ultimately land on another list of search results. That would be the price watch example. Google says it was a desire to improve these user experience issues that motivated the experimentation, not an effort to push its own shopping results. The goal, Google says, was to come up with the right mix of shopping aggregators as well as actual merchant sites. Eventually, Google says it found a mix its raters liked. The FTC says liked a little, but okay one that retained the best aggregators as well as providing for overall result diversity. That's what was kept. It stressed this type of diversity, something it aims for in other instances. Let's say you search for Birdman, where people may want theaters and showtimes, a trailer, 
info on actors as well as news, and that's what Google does do very well, right? Yeah. It does give you a diverse right. mix of results. Google says the shopping algorithm change was limited to English language searches only for those within the U.S., those outside the U.S., such as in the EU, or those searching in languages other than English from anywhere didn't get it. I don't know why that would be. Google said that the FTC addressed the experiment with its closing statement to say that it was part of the changes that could, quote, reasonably be viewed as improving the overall quality of Google's search results because the first search page now presented the user with greater diversity of websites. Well, you can see where the argument is. You can see both sides have a point of view. You can see that the FTC commissioners, having weighed those, decided to trust Google's The statement. Wall Street Journal's report, I think, made it seem as if they'd found the smoking gun and said, aha, Google did that. Let's go to something where I think there is a, a less clear case here, Okay, which I wrote about, which is that Google is accused of having said to, of, 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 of scraping TripAdvisor and um, Yelp and such. Okay, they, they scrape things. I have no problem with that. I went through this kind of piece by piece. Where's my line? Scraping is not a problem. It's the same as reading. Uh, holding on to it so that you can analyze uh, it for search behind your wall. Not a problem, in my view. Some argued that was a copyright violation to hold on to a copy. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, I see That's that what a search all... engine does, let's face it. Exactly. So I have no problem with that, right? Um, quoting from a site in the process of linking to it. Well, this is the essence of the, get ready, folks, Leistungsschutzrecht yeah. and Spain link tax fight. But I've already made my view on that clear. I have zero problem. That's fair use. And I agree with you. It doesn't, it's an ex, it's a, it's a extract to give exactly. you an idea of what you're going to get. So here's where we get to the problem. It does not replace the content. Here's where we get to the problem. Snippets are okay. Is it, it, is, it is alleged that Google, uh, I think, it, 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 that Google wholesale copied and republished content from the places like Yelp. That would be, in my view, a clear violation of copyright. The second part, then, of this was that uh, it is alleged in the uh, journal that when competitors asked Google to stop taking their content, and I'm quoting, it threatened to remove them from the search engine. This that, is the problem. Google wields a mighty stick. would be a terrible action. Right. But I don't see that that's been proven conclusively in what was said here. And the reason is because what we know is Yelp's never never disappeared from search. In fact, that's how I get to it most days. When I search on a restaurant on the way home, it's the Yelp link that I click on because it has a better phone link on it, and I use it all the time. So I don't know that that actually, actually ever happened. If Google threatened it, that would be wrong. That would yeah. be evil. That would be un -Googly. I don't know whether there's pure guilt there. So that's one case. That's, I agree argument. with you. That's That would be a, a very strong smoking gun. You'd That'd have to find thing. an email to Yelp Yelp should step forward. This is an opportunity to say, yeah, I got the email right here where Google says we're going to pull you. Well, let's see it. Now, let's also remember let's this is, a, a, this was seven years ago. Right. And B, uh, it is a, it, 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 it's a if, it, if it happened, it's a wrong action. There should be something about that. I have no problem. But is that cause to launch a gigantic investigation to break up the company? I, you know, I, I, I think one stupid sin does not that make. Remember the whole case about Google supposedly scraping people's data as they drove by, you know, and there were calls to break them up right then. If they did that, that would be wrong and that would be evil. They shouldn't have done that. There should be consequences, but what are those consequences? The next thing is this question of Google favoring its own services, and I, and I dig into that too. And here I'm still going to say, and I, I understand your point, Leo, that, that, that they're in uh, other businesses and that puts them in a position of conflict of interest, and that's why I've always said they can't own content purely. But um, let's remember a couple things. Uh, there is, who, who says, show me the law that says that search must be impartial. Let's remember a couple things. Number one, that's the last thing we want because that's noisy search. I want search to be highly partial, partial toward quality, relevance, authority, uh, timeliness, and other factors. Impartiality is also impossible. Literally it impossible. is impossible. We know that in journalism, we know that in search. So it's a ridiculous, made-up standard. No such standard exists. Let's start there. Then, then let's also remember that the idea of ads in search originally came from Bill Gross's GoTo.com, which became Overture, which was bought by Yahoo. And Google eventually had to pay, I believe the number was $365 million in a patent set of settlement with Overture and Yahoo because they took the idea of putting ads in search. Now, when GoTo did it, the advertiser paid for placement. They paid for preferential treatment in search. And that was 
the way it was. Google is the one who set their standard, who said, no, that'll be bad search. So Google set its own bar. There's no law anywhere that said you couldn't have prejudicial search. If you want to, you can. It's a product. You can make prejudicial newspapers. You can make prejudicial TV shows. You can make prejudicial search. There's no law anywhere that says that search should be uh, impartial in that sense. Now, at the same time, the FTC does indeed take companies to action, not for violating the law, but for violating the company's own promise to consumers. So the question here is, did Google ever promise to consumers that search results would be so-called impartial? I can't find that. Google did promise that uh, ads should be relevant and labeled. Both of those things are true. So I don't see, uh, uh, you know, if it's true that Google purposefully and with competitive intent downgraded competitors to push its own services, I would say that would be wrong. But I do not think we've seen a smoking gun of that happening. The only other two points in the journal that I mentioned is one is that they uh, allegedly restricted advertisers from using data obtained during a Google ad campaign in ad campaigns elsewhere. I think that's wrong. I think that goes against the principles of Google and open information. And Google did stop that practice. But I think it was a wrong practice. I don't know that it was necessarily oh. illegal. I think it was on Google. And then finally, in just a graphic, Google said that, uh, uh, the journal said that Google tried to restrict sites that did search mm. deals uh, from also doing deals with competitors, including Bing. Uh, I would say that's just that's just stupid. That would be a red cape for antitrust investigators. But in the report, according to the journal, uh, one investigator said there was insufficient evidence, and so that one doesn't go. So in the, in the bottom line here is that I don't see, again, I wish they'd have more so I could criticize about them more. I have criticized them for, for things. But I think that we have to take the journal's worldview and Murdoch's worldview here of going after Google with a grain of salt. And it's the journal basically is trying to accuse the White House of a politically motivated dropping of the action against Google because of the close connections to Google. Witness the next story that came out was um, all the people who've gone from Google to the White House. I'm a journalist. I know how these tricks operate. And I think we've got to judge the messenger. There's another thing that has to be said anytime you talk about antitrust, uh, because there's a, a bit of confusion about what is illegal and what isn't illegal. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but I do watch The Good Wife. And, and one thing that people need to be aware of is the fact that it's not against antitrust law to do things that harm competitors. This is something people don't understand. You have to harm competition itself, the competitive process meaning that you have, to, you have to artificially inflate prices, you have to artificially do something that harms consumers, and then it can be a, uh, an antitrust issue. This really is very, point. very difficult in search results because you can't filter anything in search, search results. You rank things. All the results are always there. They're just in slightly different orders and throwing uh, a fly, fly into the ointment. They're different for individual people because of personalization. So, for example, when you've got... YouTube is the second result looking for this week at Google. I got this is the third result. Right. I the second result was yeah. Wikipedia. So th you'd th almost have to log out to find out what th you start happens. pulling the thread out of the sweater for, from yeah. the FTC's point of view. There's no end to it, and it will be very, very difficult to to find that prices have been raised, that that, that consumers have been harmed, or any of this stuff. Even as complex as these issues are, it's very difficult to actually make a solid case that will hold up. Which is what the economists, the economists report, that's what they concentrate on, is just that. Yeah, the lawyers are concentrating on the actions uh, and so on. Do me a favor. Go to Google and search for maps, and then go to Bing and search for maps. And tell me who's more upstanding. Uh, yeah, Google Maps, MapQuest. Uh, you know, i got to log out, though, to really get this to be, uh, let me sign out of my Google account and search for maps. Okay, without being signed in. Oh, actually, I didn't have to do that. I could have just done an incognito tab. Oh, well. Yes, Google Maps, MapQuest, Yahoo Maps, Bing Maps, Weather Maps. In other news, MapQuest still exists. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. All right, let me go to Bing.com. I don't think I'm signed in there. And search for Maps. But remember, Google's not going to make a big mistake. Bing is number one, MapQuest number two, Yahoo Maps, Maps. I don't see Google How Maps. How far do we have to go to get Google? Keep going. I don't see Google Maps, go MapQuest, Rand, McNally. It's not in the first page. Uh, see, now, come on. Come on, folks. Which is the more upstanding company? And also, <laughs> and also, which is the better map service? Well, how do you, you make know, the case that Bing is the number I, one best? I think Google I Maps is better than WorldAtlas.com, and it's I below it. I don't begrudge Bing putting their maps first. That's my other point. 
the other point I make is that if we if we if we held if we're calling Google a publisher and hold them to the standards the publishers hold themselves to, they never promote their competitors. Never, 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 never. The European publishers, led by the Germans, made a big video about how when you search on shoes on Google, running shoes, running shoes is an example. Oh my God, you're going to get ads, ads, ads. But then you also get Nike and 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 other companies. If you go to Bild, the largest newspaper in Europe, owned by the company that has led the fight against Google, and there's a whole shoe tab on the site, you don't get anything but their own ads. And so do we expect people to promote us and us people? No, we don't in any other world. So why do we have this supposed standard of no self-promotion and objective search? Because they're a monopoly. They're, no, sorry. There's no such thing as either. Well, and that's one of the things we also learned from the Wall Street Journal report, which is that Google was very happy to see Com's, Com's score results that said they're not a monopoly, yeah. even though they weren't accurate. Because right. Google knows it's a monopoly, and they just don't want anybody else to think so. It's because like, the rules well, change for monopolies, standard. as you say. Yeah. It's the wrong standard for monopoly. The issue isn't search monopoly. And, 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 you know, the number is much higher. It's 50% higher in Germany. The issue is advertising monopoly. And that's why I said that Google's primary weakness is in having the power of God over whether advertisers may or may not be in the service and how they're treated. And that, the FTC had any brains about how search, I mean, Danny's real point here is they don't understand how search operates. And this is the danger of government regulation of these kinds of activities. I think that's unfair. First of all, the FTC has declined to prosecute. So they, if they did if the that's right your, thing, in my view. Then yes. they did the right thing if that's your point of view. I'm not, by the way, in that camp. But if that's your point of view, they did the right thing. So you, it's ridiculous to say they don't understand search. Apparently they do. Well, Maybe the those lawyers report. doing that report the didn't. report didn't, yes. But I, I don't think that's accurate. I think that there are different ways to look at this, and it depends on your point of view. And ultimately, I think it comes down to whether you trust Google or not. And if you give Google's statements credibility, then you'll say, oh, okay, that makes sense. But I think you can also interpret the actions in, in a more uh, negative way fashion now yeah, and I and I put where my lines are and with appropriate proof I said they, these are lines that if Google crossed they'd be wrong I think but we don't I, I think we don't know I think we don't it, know That's it comes exactly down right. to do you trust do Google know. and what Google has said yeah what they say makes sense whether it's true I don't know it's a very self-serving yeah. statement but here's the other part of it, you know is that what I was hearing all week and this is just me is that the world, you know, all around Germans and Americans may be, oh, you Germans better eat crow. Oh, look at this, what the FTC says. Well, look at the journal. Better Germans better eat crow. Google's evil, Google's wrong. Google should be broken up. I don't see that. But that's, that's, that's part of the problem here of, of where... Welcome to the Internet, Jeff. I don't, I don't think that's what a sensible oh, no, no. person's saying. A, oh, here's, oh, I'll be a sensible very, person. There were some, there were some well-known journalists okay. and, and media executives who were saying I don't. I wouldn't say Jeff Jarvis should eat crow. What I would say is the FTC... Did the, the process work? The FTC did a, a, a reasonable thing, whether it's right, I don't know, a reasonable thing yep. based on the, all the reports they received, and it looks as if they got good information. I'm glad the Wall Street Journal <coughs> published this report because I think it's important to know the full facts well, of the like case. The full I would like to have I would like it all. all. And, the and it bothers me that the FTC feels this should not be in public view because it should be all of it. Well, I don't know what the normal process is. Staff reports have no idea, but once the journal has it journalistically, why isn't the journal putting up the entire I don't know either about that. So I want to see it all. Uh, and I think that that's a reasonable thing because this, this is a discussion that is an appropriate. Don't you feel an appropriate discussion? You want Danny Sullivan to lose sleep for the next week. <laughs> the other thing I would say is we yell at Comcast because Comcast isn't just in the internet business, Oops. it's in the TV business, it's in the content creation business, it's in the uh, telephony no, business. Why. No, I don't yell at Comcast for that, Leo. You but but I just, well, I do because it muddies the waters. I understand we live in, in the heavens, that what I want is not we reasonable in the society one. we live in. The businesses in this society have free reign, and they have free reign to enter any area they wish and compete, and compete vigorously. That's a free market. But I do believe that we are in a situation where some companies are starting to dominate. I think Google is dominant. I would feel much better about this if Google had two or three equal competitors, just as I'd feel much better about Comcast if they had. We're two seeing that they are. They are getting. They are starting. To yes, I think that's very important. And I would love to see. Wait a minute. And I would love to see a search engine. I don't mind if they sell ad results. That's fine. They've got to monetize. But that's what they do. They do search and ad results. And they leave it at that. I would love to see that. I, and it, because
because a search engine has a higher mission, it is too so important for it to be a hurly burly, you know, free market business. Here's why I disagree with that. Because then if you separate, as someone wants to do, if you separate search from, let's say, maps, then then the map company doesn't know my searches. It doesn't know that I like often looking for pizza where I am or blah, 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 blah. That connection of personal data matters. I spend all my time now arguing to the media business. That they've got to get in the relationship business. They've got to get their own first party data. And they've got to start giving people relevance in the manner that Google does. Well, you you just chopped off the relevance engine. Well, I, do I, I think there's a societal cost. Put a fence around them. I think there's a societal, I, yeah, I understand. And I think there's a societal cost to that convenience. And uh, I, I prefer, I would prefer to see many smaller, more narrowly focused businesses okay. than giant businesses that are using the interrelationships between the different arms of their business in a synergistic way that is often to our disadvantage. Well, and yes, know. we'd be giving up some great stuff like Google Now. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a fair trade. Oop. I think it, we'd be in a better world if we had many small businesses you know, Here's the other problem. Competing against this, each other. This is the other, the other argument I heard from, from my European friends, particularly, was and I, I, had, I had an hour long conversation with an Austrian journalist about this time. And it's, well, they could do this, they could do that. Just because you could do something is not, unless, unless you're Tom Cruise with a big screen in front of you, that is not cause for legal action. Right. It's what you actually do I agree. that matters. Yeah. And, and, and I think that we're, 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 there's too much going on here that says, Google's too big. Well, well, again, show me the law that says too big. Show me that. Show no, me where the line is. So that absolutely, I can't go there. They're absolutely within their rights and the great American tradition of free enterprise. I'm not saying it's it should be against the law. I'm just saying it would be nice and, aesthetically. And I think that uh, I think that the thing that has to be mentioned is the fact that we're moving to a world of relying on virtual assistants for a lot of answers, and they don't give you results. They just give you answers. And you yes. don't know where it came from. And it's like, you know, right. talk to Siri and say, hey, Siri, no. what's the deal with X, Y, Z? And it says, here's the answer. Apple has intentionally oh, where did that come from? cut the head off right. of that result. Exactly. They don't want it to say Google. And so and that, are, that's there is a competition harder problem. Growing. There is competition growing. Man. We have a story in the rundown today, Business Insider, and it's typically blunt way, saying that, uh, you know, is Larry Page asleep at the switch? Uh, Google should be scared to death of Facebook. Um, Facebook's not nearly as big as Google yet, but it is making huge inroads. And I, and I, I want to remind you of the days when, when certain parties thought that Microsoft was going to take over the world, and now Microsoft is darn near a laughing stock, except on your show. Because they're nice to them. <laughs> it's just you're nice, so to nice to them. I don't know. I think in Windows Weekly, we spent a lot of time going, what is No, you do. You do. You do. I, 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 just, I just got a joke. Sorry. I, you know, this is a great conversation, and, and uh, I, I, I completely see your point of view. Uh, and not yours. We just uh, disagree. Yeah, I don't even know if we disagree. Um, yeah, we I, I fear a company where those synergies are so massive that we become little cogs in their data machine. Is it possible? But here's the question. Because somebody went after me, somebody who's a Google hater went after me when I said that I think Google's basically a good company. Oh, Google apologist. No, I agree with you. I think they are basically and a good company. Well, but that's that's the question. Yeah, well, that's that's part of the question. I think that there are those who think that companies, uh, you know, Siva Vadnathian, who I respect greatly, just says companies must be companies, and basically they're going to. I, I don't want to. I'm, I'm going to solve this before I Siva. I don't want to do that. But that there are those who would say companies will inevitably go bad, be wrong, be corrupt. Um, can we believe in the possibility of a good company? And I still hold out the idea that we can, because if we don't, if we can't. Um, then, yeah, you, you reflexively regulate everything, but you then limit the upside of the world that's being created. And, and that's, I, I know I sound like a libertarian. I'm a Hillary Clinton Democrat. I'm, 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 I'm a liberal. I believe there's need for government in many cases, but I don't believe in reflexive regulation. Well, I agree you know, with you on that. I think we all agree on that. Well, a lot don't. A lot. But I, don't. I do feel like there's such power in, uh, nowadays in a, in a search engine like Google mm -hmm. too be the arbiter of, of fact to it's, its curation and I think they should be a, I would love to see an order a priesthood that would would hold as its highest goal to do the best job at that as possible and of course if that's their highest goal then they wouldn't get into side businesses that you know you maximize profit by getting inside well, so businesses. use 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 duck duck make them a non-profit oh god 
communist. Well, I think there are some don't, things. Don't go each I, I don't want to. I think there are. I think there are some things. The roads are a good example. Uh, the roads should be nationalized. They shouldn't be run by private business because otherwise you get uh, interlocking toll roads and you get all sorts of horrible things happening. There are certain things that work best if they are not held by a for-profit entity. Never with speech. Never. That, that is a First Amendment violation. Speech, search is speech, damn it. And if you then do that, because, hey, that's exactly what, you know, China wants. Yeah, we'll control the search for your own good. I don't mean government run, I mean non-profit. Uh, like, non-profits are any better? No, I'm sorry. I mean, well, I think that uh, if you... I know plenty of non-profits that are, that, are, that, are, that are greatly compromised because of where their money comes from. You'd also have to suppress speech in the sense that if you had, let's say, for example... Well, they have the right but, to do this. I'm not contesting yeah, but what, it. But right. what I'm saying is, is there are market forces here. There, there, you know, there's, there's how reality works. If Google were suddenly handed over to a nonprofit organization, it would suddenly halt in its tracks because nonprofits are very, very slow. And then some nimble startup would come out of Stanford and everybody would gravitate toward it, and you'd either be back to Google again with with a, with a private guess, company making these decisions, okay. or you'd be saying, we, we have a law saying you can't have a search engine. I, I understand have, what I'm proposing yeah. is not practical. I completely understand but that. I know I'm you're just, being provocative. I'm, I'm not even being provocative. I think this would be the, I think we need a society of Jesuits who are oh, who have a single that. goal, which is to curate, to provide a, a good search that is not tainted by appearance or fact of uh, competition. It would Google solve also this privacy issue. You know, people are worried about Google. The, the more these synergies happen, the more Google knows about you. It scares people. All of those would go away because Google wouldn't need to know anything about you. You know what you're doing, Leo? You're, you're erasing Gutenberg. You're going back to the scribes. You want you want scribal search. Not in every respect, but in one... In, yeah, if you're going to give a, a company the right to curate, the right to arbitrate fact, it, it, it's become such a powerful thing. Yeah. I feel like, I know it's not going to happen. The, the bottom line is that, number one, there's no such thing as a, as valueless search results or content. You, a, a search engine company has its corporate values. Those are not going to be in line with anybody else's values, yours, mine, anybody's. And the, the second horrible reality is that any sort of entity that has a search engine it, it, somebody has to do it. Somebody has to. Is yes. the government the right one? Yes. No. Is it is a bunch of Jesuits? I don't know about that. You know, no, there's it's always going to be somebody. Point. I understand. Yeah. There's always a point of view. Um, so that's why the next best thing is to have true competition. And I, I yeah. while you might say, oh yeah, well we got Bing, and we got Bing, there's not competition. So, in search. so I'll go back to Alta Vista. There is not comp. There is not competition in search, and the default is Google. And I don't. I don't know where these these market share numbers come from because no one I know uses anything but Google. One one good thing is that it's not universal. So, for example, in Russia, Yandex is a bigger search engine. Yeah, it's just Google. it's just in the U.S. It, it, well, yeah. U.S. isn't even nearly as as Actually, it's bad as it is Europe, in Europe. Right? In Europe, it's like yeah. ninety right. three percent or more, something like that. U.S. is is much better. Sixty three or sixty three or something like yeah. that. Yeah, but well, those those there's a lot of people. Though. Well, but it's the same reason as why does why is Yahoo still around? Why is right. AOL still around? Because people have habits that go way, way back, and that and that's we're we're not like that. You you try every darn new thing down the pike. Is, um, but that's is not Duck true. Go a true competitor? No, it's not. Why not? But, you know, being, being an AOL and Yahoo are together, and uh, yeah, but 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 Duck, Duck Go is not. Where does Duck, Duck Go's uh, res, where do their results come from? They come from other search engines, right? I, yeah, because they, they, they keep saying they're going to make a crawler. I don't know if that's a viable No, You know, another way to look at this, is a whole different way to look at this, is you could argue that what Google should open source is the crawl. The crawl data. Okay. And let others build on top I of like that. I like that. Let others right? be the curators. But, but what, I, what I'm buying, so what I'm buying from Google, what I'm with my time, and my is their curation, is their point. Is, of view. is there is the value they are adding? Yeah. Is, is the, I is like the this idea. Partiality they're adding in. This is analogous to the idea of let the municipalities create the in infrastructure for an internet, but let a hundred companies on top of it provide the internet access. I like that idea. Again, it's something that's never going to happen because that is the crown jewel. 
But no, uh, if, if you were France and Germany when they were trying to create their own Google, they were trying. Well, there's a couple things here. One, they were trying to create the wrong thing. Yeah. Two, I would argue once again, the monopoly is not in search. The monopoly is in advertising. Right. That's what nobody looks at. Except it is in and search because the crawl data is impossible to duplicate. Yeah, but it's all no. It's beyond that. It's now just a marketplace because because the search data doesn't really greatly affect um, DoubleClick the way it does search ads. And DoubleClick is a huge part of the business. And video ads aren't well, greatly affected by the search results. So you no, know, Google's monopoly is in is in digital advertising. Well, that if that's the case, that's, that's good news because they, they, as you point out, Facebook and others are giving a run for their money. Yeah. So uh, if that's the case, then but I feel like it's not the case because I feel like they have what they have really is the, is the index of the internet, and uh, that is so hard to duplicate. No, I don't think it's the it's not it's not the raw data about the internet. It's not the screen. You're saying data. it's the information they have about us. It's relevance. It's it's the experience data. Yeah. yeah. So what? But but even that even that again I don't think that's the monopoly. <laughs> Let's take a break. I think it's a great conversation, uh, and I don't, I don't think there's an answer to it. And I actually think the FTC did the right thing after looking at all this analysis. Yeah. But I'm also glad that uh, I, I, I maybe don't go as far as you do as saying this is a hit piece by Rupert Murdoch. I think it's appropriate for the journal. I, I want to see. Well, you Let's know, publish it all, Wall Street Journal. I'm just saying, and I, I don't want to besmirch Wall Street Journal journalists. The journalists, the Wall Street Journal, no, are I wonderful, think they're amazing work. Yeah. But they are affected by, uh, I think one must judge some things in the light of the, the ongoing, never-ending attacks on Google, I think have an impact um, on, on how we judge that. Yeah, but you know what? Real people don't care. They just say, what's the best search engine? Actually, they don't even say that. <laughs> right. They don't know what they're doing. They just type it in the hole in the top of the browser, and whatever happens, whatever comes out, that's what they use. That's really what is what the back end of the power? That's of the Google power. back end of, of Siri in terms of, of, of the search results. It's a variety of things, including yeah. Google, Wolfram Alpha, uh, Wikipedia. And they, they have a tendency to try to get rid of Google as much as possible. Uh, no, I think they use Google. What they have a tendency to do is to strip the name strip Google. Strip the ads out, <laughs> right. Uh, if I were Google, I'd be a lot more incensed about what Apple's doing to them yeah. than what other companies are saying about Google doing to them. March is National Business Month, so get going. It's business time. We're uh, brought to you today by LegalZoom.com. If you're thinking about starting a business, well, it could be a better time. Mm. National Start Your Business Month. And at LegalZoom.com, they're celebrating. It's never been easier to build your future. LegalZoom provides all the support you need, as it did for me 10 years ago when I started my business. In fact, that's, that's about what they've been doing it for just a little bit longer than that. And they've helped a million business owners, just like me, get started with LLCs or S or C Corps or uh, doing their trademark. We got, uh, we got two tri tri trademarks. It was very easy. Did not need a lawyer for that. Uh, I just needed LegalZoom. And that's good because LegalZoom is not a law firm. They just help you get stuff done at your direction. However, here's a good thing. If you do need advice for your business, no problem. They're not a law firm. You're not going to a building with 100 lawyers in it. What they've done, though, is build a network of independent, trusted attorneys that will provide the guidance you need for your specific situation. And you can choose that attorney based not only on their profile, but on the edited reviews from LegalZoom. Users. Here's the best part. During National Start Business Month, LegalZoom is offering an attorney consultation for 50 bucks. My attorney, as soon as he answers the phone, 50 bucks. Right. I don't have not one word. That's a hundred bucks. Two words, three hundred bucks. Fifty bucks. If you're unsure about the best way to start it, and by the way, I'm not knocking my attorney. I'm just saying it's expensive. If you're unsure about the best way to start it, if you want to run a business and you need some advice, this offers for you. Get legal advice for your business with no further obligation for a low one-time cost. Two wills too. I highly recommend this. this is a medical power medical attorney. If you don't have one, you got to get one. A medical director. It, the, the, the wills and all that stuff on LegalZoom are far less expensive even than on Better Call Saul. He's a <laughs> bottom of the barrel and attorney. He's as cheap as you can get. <laughs> I've only seen it two episodes, it's but I'm loving it. Go to LegalZoom.com today. Find out more. Attorney consultations are provided by independent attorneys available in most states. Get the legal help you need for your business at LegalZoom.com. And by the way, not only do you get that $50 consultation, but you can also use the offer code TWIG in the referral box and you'll save you. 
LegalZoom.com. Please use the offer code TWI. Gee, Mike Elkins here. Love having you here. Oops. Appreciate Love you being here earlier this Love show. We, uh, we were at the Facebook F8 conference. Huh? That's right. <clears throat> suck on That's stage. Right. He, killed, he killed a buffalo on stage. <laughs> it was amazing. Did he eat it? Uh, yes, he did. He, had, he ate as much as he could. He had blood all over his face. It was horrible. Uh, it, it, you know, it is clear when you watch Facebook that they have ambitions far beyond yes. that of a social, mere social That's network. Right. They want to be an alternative internet, basically. Yeah, you know, it really looked like they want to be AOL. Yes, that's right. Like you go into that's Facebook right. at the beginning of the day, and everything is within there. When they send me a disk, I'm done. You're done. I'm canceling my <laughs> Facebook account. They did announce, uh, well, so last year at F8, this is their developers conference. By the way, we will continue to cover it tomorrow, the second keynote, right. 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. 1700 UTC, Mike and I will be here, and it's going to be, we think, the Oculus Rift stuff. Right. Virtual reality, VR helmet stuff. Uh, but today, uh, what they were talking about wasn't as revolutionary as last year. It was really kind of the same stuff. Yep. But, uh, you know, the, the idea that we, it's, Facebook's motto is very famously, uh, what is it, uh, work fast and break things, or something like that. Go fast and break things. And, uh, Get drunk and break things. <laughs> last year, Zuck said, "Well, what we really do is want to. Our new motto is uh, go fast and provide a stable infrastructure." Which is not the same ring. <laughs> He's older now. <laughs> yes, that's age. Yeah, that's that's what happens when you hit thirty. Uh, but for developers, that's kind of what they want to hear. And so, what was really about a developer platform? But the one thing that is kind of interesting though, this whole year has been about deconstructing Facebook, taking the big blue page and turning it into slices of apps like Messenger and WhatsApp and Instagram, and, and I think more are coming all the time. This was a little bit in the opposite direction. They wanted to say Messenger is a platform. A platform was the big the word they kept saying again and again. And they showed Messenger integration features, the ability for you as a developer to create an app that worked with Messenger. They showed Jib Jab. And it becomes a part of the messenger infrastructure, extends messenger in effect. Yeah, which who wants that? I didn't want it. But it's yeah. It seems to me that they want to their the whole their whole multiple app strategy. And again, I've I've said before, I think they're going to have more than a hundred apps apps within a, a year or two. They want to get everybody as occupied with Facebook stuff as possible. If anybody's going to do anything else, they're going to do Snapchat or anything like. They want to get in front of it. They want to yeah. get you know sort of sort of capture that behavior and get people doing it on it. Now, I, I, my guess is that even today, a huge number of people use Instagram either don't know or don't care that that's a Facebook product. They just like Instagram, and this is fine with, with, with Facebook. It doesn't even look like a Facebook. It I mean, doesn't, it doesn't, you know. It, it doesn't seem to have Facebook any uses, but, okay, but, but here, it's the Facebook is the one that has a monopoly on our relationships. One our U.S. the most yeah. common, right? 1.4 billion users. Google gets crap all over about about tying the relationship database it has across its applications. Facebook doesn't, right? And I don't, I don't think they should. But it's 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 interesting to me that that's that's what makes this powerful is that Facebook knows you across WhatsApp and and, and Messenger and Facebook. Well, and the only thing they need to know is is it's you so they can serve you ads, right? And also harvest your personal data and behavior. I mean, they have something called Moves. I don't know if you've ever used this, but basically it automatically tracks your how much you're running and biking and all that kind of stuff, but also where you go. So if you look at your day, it says, oh, you were at Starbucks for 22 yeah. minutes. But Google's been doing that for years. Yes, yes, but it, but this is a, an interesting thing that now Facebook can take that sort of location data and they can apply it to advertising on Messenger, for example, or some, some other location. So you have an ad network that's across all the platforms exactly. and you have data aggregation across and all the platforms. It's powered by that. And which, yes. which, again, I'm arguing that rather than trying to kill all that going on, what I argue in my media conferences is get in that game, people. We'll talk in a few minutes probably about, about Facebook and news. This is this has been my, my sermon on that point. But aren't, the you best rest, part of that aren't you sitting on top of uh, sand? Because really, ultimately, if you build your business on Facebook, their interest is not you, it's them. Yes, but it depends upon the deal. Um, I, I think that the idea that we have to continually drive people to us and our sites, that goes away, especially in a mobile world. We're going to have to go to where people are. So the art of this, I would argue, is what deal Facebook does. And I've talked with Facebook about this. And I wrote a post before all these announcements and, and leaks saying, here's my wish list of what, what I wish Facebook would do for news. And, and 
then when there's word from the New York Times that they are talking to news organizations, my message is very simple. It's not sufficient to put your content up on Facebook to get branding. Good. It's not sufficient to put there to get links. Good. It is a help to get revenue. Facebook should start sharing revenue from those cases. That would be a good thing. But that's not, neither is that a business model. What you need to get is data. Now, the, the yes but I get from everywhere is, well, about privacy. My argument is very simple, that when you make, if the user makes a transactional agreement to say that I want to share this data piece so I get this relevance back, then it works. An example I give is Facebook can say, well, Jeff, we see that you follow the Jets a lot so you can make fun of your friend Jim Brady and your poor son who is a fan of the Jets. And we see you care about this topic. And we also see that you, you, you follow NJ.com a lot and The Guardian a lot. They cover those topics. Would you like us to alert them to alert you when things that are relevant happen? And I can say yes or no. And if I say yes, I've now given permission for that data about me, that information about me to pass across because I'm going to get relevance back. Same as I do on Waze when Waze knows where I live and where I work and I get relevance back from that. I think it is possible to construct things on Facebook that will give media companies the data they don't have. The problem is, you know, once they have it, well, they know what to do with it. Probably not. But that's what we have to fix in my business because we're still in the mass business where all we do is give anonymous, faceless eyeballs messages. That business is commodified. The value will go to zero. We have to go to relevance. There's various ways to do relevance. This show, your shows, are one way to do relevance. You target the content extremely. Another way to do it is what Facebook and Google do. I don't know that Facebook's going to give any data across, so, but what I say to media companies is, if they do, do the deal. You're building your own business. You're, you're learning more about your consumers than you have learned in the last 20 years. Go for it. If they don't, yes, sand is on your feet. But I, I don't see any evidence. For, first of all, I, don't, I wouldn't lump Facebook and Google into the same category. They are categorically in the same uh, scenario. But they, what they, you know, I don't trust Facebook. I mean, we were watching the, the, the announcement today, and they flat out said, oh, this is a great kind of advertisement because users can't tell the difference between the, ad, the video ads and the regular videos. That's why it's so good. That's why it's so powerful. And, but that's but Mike, and, where the whole industry is going through that problem with native advertising. Okay, but and I there, agree. There's something provably shameless about Facebook. Uh, if you recall the advertisements that they used to have, where they were clearly ads and they labeled them in a misleading way to make you think that they weren't ads. And they, they were called sponsored content. posts oh, okay. or, or recommended it's posts. I think they called them. So I did. I did a test, Mike. I went to. I, I took a screenshot. This is of a medium today. I don't know if you can find it quickly. Uh, I, I, I took us a, a screenshot from Upworthy which has a little box and it says the word promoted on it. And I went to Google and I paid 50 bucks for Google uh, consumer uh, uh, surveys. And I asked people, what does promoted mean in this context? Does it mean that an advertiser promoted it, that the editors promoted it, that the readers promoted it, or an algorithm promoted it? <laughs> yeah. About 44% got it right, which is to say that the majority got it wrong. The majority didn't know it was an ad. Yep. How about this and, one? And suggested post. Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> right. Who suggested it? Who suggested that? Facebook's advertiser. Well, you know, and this is the thing that bugs me. And, and Facebook likes to brag about how 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 much more videos are being played on Facebook. The reason yeah, they are is they tweak, automatically. Their, they tweak their algorithm as well. They're put they're censoring more stuff that is not videos from and keeping it from coming into your newsfeed. And they are pushing videos, these trivial like inane videos. And they're pushing those, and then they're auto-playing, as you pointed out. And they're saying, look at all these people. They love video. Well, I just don't trust Facebook. I think they tweak these algorithms for the reasons. You know, we had a long discussion about about whether Google was being anti-competitive and how they tweak their algorithms and, and, and show product information. I just think Facebook is just shameless about how they push things in the news feeds. They have total power. They've admitted, they admitted at the last FA conference that they only push from business pages, uh, what was it, 12% uh, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, so every business tiny, has learned that this is not. Yeah, a tiny number actually like make it into customers. people's news feeds. Yeah. And so, you know, this really bugs me. And, and I just, you know, I just don't think it's a, in, even in the same ballpark as what Google does with their algorithms. I think it was a mistake for Facebook. I, mean, I think it's still true on the right that you do get the raw feed of everything that goes into your feed, right? I, I think that Facebook should make that extremely accessible so you can just, you know, you'll decide which is better for you. And I think most people will decide that the Facebook curated feed is better. Except they'll never do um, that. They'll never do that. 
Yeah, even Scoble, because I, I did observe that in Facebook, that if I go to the chron chronological <laughs> to the news feed, that I would get everything. And he said, oh, you don't want to do that. <laughs> he said, well, and, you know, I think in some respects this might be the right answer. You want to give Facebook enough signals so that their algorithm can give you a feed of something you really will like. So when you go to news feed, you can click the, you know, the selector. I don't, I doubt anybody much knows this and you can either do top stories or most recent if you do most recent yeah you're getting everything but no one does that and 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 uh scoble's point was just you know spend hours teaching facebook what you yeah. like and you'll love it hundreds of hours i cannot i am i would and by the way here you see i don't really want this now this says sponsored before i had another one that yeah, says sponsored is a better, is better i like sponsored i know and this video auto-played, and so, uh, you know, I, of course I'm watching this video. No, I'm not. That's bogus. I'd like to know how many videos were clicked on Facebook, not how many videos were played. Um, I, I just, I can't wait to get rid of Facebook. I really can't. <laughs> you go so back and forth on that. So no, funny. I don't. I never wanted Facebook. I only have to have it, because how else do we have this conversation? Right. Um, I have to have it. I don't want to have it. And I don't really get any co anything coming in. But here's, now Lisa here's loves it. Now let's say let's assume Lisa's kind of a normal person. She's married yeah, to me, but she's kind of a normal person. Um, she loves it. I keep saying this to her. She says, "No, this is I see all my friends. I have a great time." She looks at it all the time. Loves it. Nobody likes I, Facebook. I she feel likes her friends. Horrible after I look at it. I don't ever feel good. The fact that Facebook is talking to to big publishers. This is the ego of us big publisher, publisher talking, or in my world. But I think that's that's a hopeful sign that they're looking for quality content, that they've realized that crap doesn't pay. Um, put that on your badge. Uh, and, 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 and that's the problem. And, and, and they, just as Google had to learn about being gamed, Facebook has had to learn about being gamed by the upworthies. And, 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 right. but, you know, well, they seem to learn. I don't see a lot of that anymore. Yeah, and I think yeah. that they're trying to go for more quality in the feed. And not everybody wants the New York Times, but those who do, it'd be a better experience than the New York Times. analog, though, to what we were talking about in the last segment, because they've now become a, a curation-type mm -hmm. yeah. engine. I mean, they really are telling me what's real. What's, what's They're telling you who your relationships are and which of your relationships are irrelevant. Yeah. yeah. You don't need to talk no, to that I person. I really want them to do that. No. But I also hope Springs Eternal, as soon as Mark started talking about how great Messenger is, I reinstalled it, because I... I take Facebook off all of my uh, devices. Well, ben, ben, I, should I reinstall it on, an, on Android? It was driving me berserk. It will drive you even more berserk. For instance, one of the things they pitched at F8 was if you're a brand, you should have a uh, push me notifications I on, think the cramps. on the all checkout, the time. On, the gro on the card, so that you can interact. Because all, all the user has to do is click that. Probably even logged in through Facebook. So easy peasy. And then... All of a sudden, the brand's going to be messaging you with, like, your shoes are on the way. Oh, those shoes are great. They look good on you. You want to buy another pair of shoes? Hey, you bought shoes last week. You want more shoes? Would you like some shoes? I don't but want... That's, that's just stupidity. That makes Messenger that's less stupid. useful, not more useful to me. Right, but, but what what's the fix to that? I mean, I always go to Amazon. Well, I'm not going to click that button. The story I always tell is that is that is when I buy my daughter a Taylor Swift album, the next day I'm a dirty old man on Amazon. What does Amazon do? It gives me visibility to that data and the chance to change it. And that's what Google, well, Google does it somewhat off in, a, in, in its, in its um, dashboard. Amazon uh, probably knows Facebook enough knows about that. me that, to be bugging me all the time and has the good sense on it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Amazon. I do get emails, from, and you can opt out of this from Amazon, saying, hey, you bought the, uh, the X-Copter. Somebody is wondering if that X-Copter uses batteries. Would you like to answer that? Really? That's very annoying. Yeah, that's a... It's really annoying, but uh, I turned that off. Yeah, no, Amazon. I think Amazon uh, pays attention to signals. The good, the difference is Amazon's not in the business of selling advertising, right. and and they're better at it. I've never really seen a lot of uh, accurate contextual advertising on Facebook, no. whereas on Amazon, it's it's really. That good. was the other lie on the F8 stage. Yeah. Uh, Deborah Lou comes out mm -hmm. and says, you know, <laughs> not only do customers like native advertising in their content. But uh, but they love it that we only show them ads they like. That's right. What? I, not in my feed. I'm still getting ads for barbed wire fences. And, 
60 year old men in Petaluma. Here, I, I see I'm looking at an ad men's suits at Nordstrom. Leo, have you ever seen me wear a suit? Never. Not <laughs> once. But Facebook thinks you do. Facebook knows you should, Mike. Yeah. Let me see, actually. The, the, the date Mark I Zuckerberg. I think Mike could look was... pretty good in a suit, don't you? Mike is a it's only natty. theoretical. Natty, natty. It's never going to happen. Uh, American Express gold card. Yeah, I got that. Yeah, I got yeah. that. But see, we both have it. We're big spenders. This yeah. is just TV advertising. It's a waste of time. Because I don't, they, they should know I have that. But, but it's like, it's TV advertising. We're both getting the same ad. There's what's contextual about that, right. Leo. Right. They're showing everybody the American Express. I'm glad they no longer see. 58-year-old men in Petaluma are very <laughs> interested in these toasters. This happens in the All right. Uh, there's lots more to talk about than this dumb stuff. Let's, uh, let's, let's talk about the cool stuff. Eric Schmidt says Google's Ooh. not giving up on glass. You're a glass hole. I am a glass hole. hole. Yes, and the fact uh, that the former fact glass hole, reformed glass hole. Th this is a perfect example of the of the tech uh, the journalist echo chamber creating a yeah. lie in the public consciousness. The idea that they were retiring it was pure wishful thinking, and and here's the proof. I do wish. They Basically, did. what Google said was that they were going to take glass and they're going to take it out of the experimental phase, out of Google X. And they're going to create a product division and develop it into a consumer product. And everybody said, it's dead. <laughs> now, that is the biggest leap you can imagine. Yeah. They did exactly the same thing with their project that maps indoor location. Right. Exactly the same thing. They could sell it out of the lab. And, it, and everybody said, oh, look, it's the future. They're going to do this thing. They're going to make a real product. So this whole thing that Google Glass was dead and they were killing it off, was a fabrication by the tech media. Okay. Pure and simple. But really, they should kill it off. No. You know, you know what they should do? I said this before, I'm going to say it again. They should offer every poor glass hole the opportunity for a refund. Your money back. Well, what How many people, how many glass buyers would ask for Jason, you'd ask for your money back. Uh, I believe I'd be asking for your money My back. My money back, <laughs> and I wish you would. <laughs> Jeff, you'd be asking for your money back, oh, yeah. but I oh, guess yeah. this guy over here, Mike, uh, you wouldn't uh, want your money back? No, I wouldn't, and here's what they should do with, to make Google Glass. The whole problem was caused by the camera, because the idea of holding up a phone is something nobody ever does. Oh, wait, no, everybody does it every day. Um, <laughs> Meerkat. <laughs> but, but what they should do is, is that the camera on Google Glass should be removable so that we can get the notifications, we can get the information as we're walking around, and not be pointing a camera at people, and opposite. nobody would object to it. I think it's the opposite. It should just be the camera. On my watch now, I'm getting the notifications and the instructions. I don't need it here. Yes. What I, well, I do want a point of view camera, but it should very say red light on it. Yeah. All it needs is red light to split itself. Really, do you guys, were you satisfied with the camera? Uh, because you, you you have to aim, like, it's like looking at what your eyebrows are. No, that's not good. But, but they, 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 they I thought it was okay. It was a very wide angle lens. So you didn't well, have because otherwise that. you would see yeah, it. If you're, yeah. if you're in the men's room and you're trying to take pictures of people in the men's room, it's really easy to do. Just kidding. <laughs> um, but, 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 but the, the wearable the jump's so small. <laughs> the wearable can be, well, it's only because it's wide. It's so far away. It's, it's, it's a wide angle shrinking. <laughs> But, but the wearable computing revolution is coming, and we're going to be able to just know things, and Google Glass is a great way to just know things. I, really? You found it useful? Because I feel like that screen of over my eyebrow was too small and too difficult to look at to be really useful. I think there's other ways to do that. I think there, there are other ways, and that may not be the best way to do it, but I do think that... Uh, I like augmented reality. Yeah. I mean, well, that's what Google Glass theoretically could be. No, not, not at all. I mean, really, all it is is a monitor over your eyebrow. No, but if it's contextual and you, if the initial, remember the initial, initial faked video of Google Glass? Yeah. The guy walked around and you'd like, was so cool. information, oh, your friend wants to do this, blah, yeah. blah, blah. That was, that was yeah. augmented reality. You know what? You know what, FTC? Go after him for fraud on Google Glass. Yeah, that ad, <laughs> that video. Yeah, do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Quartz says, Google's driverless car, this probably is another journalist getting something wrong might come with airbags on the outside <laughs> to protect pedestrians. I think it should come with springs that push the pedestrians further away. <laughs> I, I can't. This can't be possibly it, be no, true. It can't be. It can't possibly be true. Out of my way, pedestrian. <laughs> this comes from a patent application that's meaningless. Sorry, yep. courts. Yep. But people patent everything. We it's, enjoyed it. It's it's a good it's a good laugh. Um, I do like this. Now I am the only person in the world who likes Google's inbox uh, app. Mm -hmm. But I think if you start to think about it as a new platform for Google to integrate mail into other things.
This makes a lot of sense. They're working on a project to let you receive bills in Gmail and pay them. It's called Pony Express. It's a, well, that's a strange name. It is. It, it may well, be no, a code. This is, this is, is going to kill the, the USPS. Ah. Uh, uh, I love this idea. So they use a third-party company to verify your identity. And this is another thing that I think is being underplayed in the report on this. Yes. Google essentially gave up on, on Google Plus as an identity platform. Right? They <coughs> their real names policy and all the rest, and now, they're, and, and now it's not your identity. Now they're talking about a third-party company that will really verify your identity. Yeah, not Google. Not Google. It's a third-party company. Do they know? Do we know the company? No, no. It's it's a it's a theoretical company okay. at this point. But this is how it would work. Right. So it would be. So they would really know who you are in the way that financial companies and people who you know who you pay, pay your bills to would be able to identify you as. But once they know who you are, once the, the Google system, the Google password is associated with a really solid identity, there you go. They've got identity. Uh -huh. That's a really really good point, Mike. Uh huh. Yeah, they always say about how Apple has all those credit cards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. This would be better than that. Yep. And I imagine if they tie it in a wallet, they already have... It might be something as simple as uh, linking to your wallet account. But Yeah. yeah. So uh, know, this but... is a document that uh, Recode uh, got that says it'll come in the fourth quarter. Uh, it may or may not be called Pony Express in the real world. That's That could just be a, a code name. Uh, but boy, I love, I, you know, this is an example of, I love my Google overlords because yeah. man, the data they get everything. Yeah. And, and, of, and of course, um, they're speculating, um, I think that was Kurt Wagner who wrote that, this, that, um, you know, they would use the data for contextual advertising. They could use the data for additional financial services, including getting loans and things uh, like that. So, um, could be the really interesting cool. thing, Mike. So, so you get your visa bill, that visa bill is itemized. Yeah. Is Google going to analyze the itemization? Yeah, why not? Why not? <laughs> Oof. <laughs> you know, I mean, there, there are already companies like our advertiser personal capital that do that. Um, to its mint does that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And again, they, you know, this is like, if you look at what, how they do ads right now on Gmail, it's basically they read the content of your, of your messages and say, oh, you're talking about scuba diving. Uh, you need this regulator or whatever. I mean, it's theoretical, but... Or better yet, you just bought a wetsuit, but do you have the tanks? Right. Or better yet, we're looking at your bank account. You've got a lot of money. <laughs> you want to... <laughs> have you considered a, a self-driving car with airbags yeah. on the outside? <laughs> From the Washington Post, a story that uh, came out uh, this morning, the nation's top technology firms and a coalition of privacy groups will be sending a letter to the Obama administration and senior lawmakers uh suggesting that Congress place curbs on government surveillance. Apparently the deadline for the Patriot Act uh, expiration, June 1st, is rapidly approaching, but the effective date really is the day Congress goes home for Memorial Day recess, which is sooner, May 21st. Yep. Um, the letter says, quote, the status quo is untenable and it is urgent that Congress move forward with reform. The Reform Government Surveillance Industry Coalition includes Apple, Microsoft, Twitter, Facebook, and of course Google. We know that there are some in Congress, this is Policy Director of the New America Foundation's Open Technology Institute, we know there are some in Congress who think they can get away with reauthorizing the expiring provisions of the Patriot Act without any reforms at all. This letter draws a line in the sand, makes it clear the privacy community. It's funny that Google considers itself part of the privacy community. Yeah. Oh no, that's another part. And the internet industry do not intend to let that happen without a fight. Good. Good on you. Uh, we'll see what happens. Remember that day, May 21st, Congress recesses. If they're going to reauthorize the Patriot Act, it will have to be before then. And that's the kind of thing you do in a late night session. Yeah. Right. On uh, Christmas on Eve. Christmas Eve. <laughs> on a holiday or something. Um. Let's see, we do the FTC stuff. Google Fiber is expanding once again. Salt Lake City, the next candidate. Google Fiber plans an experiment. This is an interesting one with targeted ads Very. for TV. Yep. They want to make TV ads more like internet ads. You were just so saying textual. That, that yeah. American Express ad was effectively a TV ad. You and I got the same ad. Exactly. And uh, so, but that's Facebook. Of course, Google isn't always all that contextually savvy either. But basically, what they're talking about 
is having the ad, like there's a moment in the programming where you can put very local advertising. Right. Like literally the, the, the store at the end of the street could actually put advertising. Cable companies that are, are already, Comcast does this, there, for instance. Yeah, there, there's Visible World, uh, NBC Universal, and Cablevision and DirecTV yep. are doing similar things. This would probably be more Google-icious. It'd probably be a little bit, a little bit better in terms. No, because you, you, what happens? You watch an ad block at a TV show, something I don't do as I do as little as possible. Yeah. But uh, you watch an ad block at a TV show. It starts with the really glitzy, high loss ads from major national right. companies, and by the end, you're it's better call Saul. Yeah, exactly. It's more and more local towards exactly. the end. Now here's the cool part: even if you DVR it, it'll put a different ad while you're watching the DVR than when you're watching the live thing. No kidding. So it doesn't care if it's a recording or live wow. or Memorex or whatever. It will always put the contextually relevant ad in there. So wow. I don't, you know, people hate this idea because they feel like it's an invasion of privacy. Yeah. I would, essentially what we do on Twitter is contextual ads in the sense that we're a very targeted service. So the ads we do are, you know, targeted at people who would watch the kind of crap that we do. Yeah. So we have ads that are, for the most part, I think, of interest to the audience. It's always better, isn't it, to have an ad that's of interest in the audience than an ad for something you don't want? The alternative is an irrelevant ad. A, a, a You're going to get an ad. Noise. You're going to get an ad, yeah. <laughs> I'd yes. rather have an ad I care about. Yeah, I think I it's... actually argue, too, that, that, that media companies should have some kind of reward for you. I'll give you... If, if I knew that I were more valuable to the New York Times by giving them, you know, 10 demographic points... You might do it. And i do it. A, I'd be more valuable to them. Maybe I get a discount on my subscription as a result. They make more money as a result. And, by the way, I get more relevant ads. No That's why we ask our viewers to help support Twit by going to twit.tv slash survey. Great segment. <laughs> Did you say twit.tv slash survey? Twit.tv slash survey. <laughs> we do this every year. We do a little survey. Actually, it's not that little. How long do you think it takes? Half an hour? Less than that. No, no. It's five minutes. Not even that long. Yeah. Uh, sure. Some of it is for us to understand better what you watch, what you like. How many of you watch video? How many of you watch audio? Which shows you watch? One of the stats we got from last year, which was very valuable, is how much, how many different shows the typical person watches. How many watch just one? How many watch two? How many watch every show we do? You know who you are. But then we also have some demographic information. Please don't be affronted by it. We're not collecting personal information about you at all. It will not in any way be linked to you. Uh, but what we do want to be able to do is uh, some advertisers want to know, well, how many men would listen? How many women? Uh, how many college educated? What's their income? That kind of thing. And we do want to be able to provide that. That gives us, I think, better uh, ads to better target uh, what you're interested in. If you don't want to do it, you do not have to. But if you do, we thank you. It's just like you given the... Uh, New York Times, some extra points, Jeff. Twit.tv yeah. slash survey. Jeff, please don't take this. You'll skew the results all. Um, I, uh, only if all of you Twig readers take it, and all of you check off that you watch Twig, and all of you say that you love Twig. Please, 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 please. Do we ask your shirt size? Dr. Mom, really? <laughs> you don't have to pee in the cup. That's the optional fifth That's right, page. it's optional. HP. Now, see, this is the this is not the story I want to do, but uh, you saw Pwn to own Cansec West. This is the big uh, security conference in Vancouver last week, shortly after the show, actually on Thursday. Uh, they had the Pwn to own contest, where teams of hackers compete to see if they can crack modern versions of operating systems and browsers. Nobody was uncracked. Google Chrome was cracked. Everybody was cracked almost all of them by a single Korean hacker named Lee who won $255,000 and a couple of laptops. And will never be unemployed. <laughs> yeah, what a job, what job security. Yeah. Steve Gibson said this guy must be really good. Yeah. One of his uh, uh, exploits chained multiple different vulnerabilities together to slowly escalate himself. The key is to be able to run a program, uh, arbitrarily run a program on that owned computer. Uh, and he wrote 2,000 lines of code to uh, hack one of them. I love Pwned Yeah. And I, uh, and I just love the name. Uh, the good news is, the thing I don't like about it is that uh, these hackers keep their information, you know, find ex exploits and they keep it to themselves mm -hmm. for as long as they can. Uh, but after the event, they do release the uh, exploits to the company so that they can them. All four major web browsers were hacked. 
I wonder, though, Jeff, if they did a Chromebook. Because, man, that feels like... I feel like when I'm on my Chromebook, I am safe. You're in the Google I am Google. safe. Lee's hack, the Chrome hack, was the one that took 2,000 lines of code. He took down both stable and beta versions of Chrome by exploiting a buffer overflow race condition in the browser, then used an info leak and race condition and two Windows kernel drivers to secure system access. Standalone Chrome bug fetch fetched $75,000. The privilege escalation bug, $25,000. To finish it off, Google's Project Zero, as it usually does when Chrome is hacked at the event, said, here's an extra $10,000 for your efforts. Lee went home with $255,000. He did say the Chrome exploit was the toughest. Okay. And not only was it his first time writing native client code, but his first time dealing with a kernel exploit. And, and also, is smart. And also, he did it by himself and was competing Not a team. teams. Not a team. Isn't that nice? Yeah. So, credit to... I want to get his, uh, his full name. Jung Hoon Lee, a Korean researcher. His, uh, his name was Loki Hart. A Vikings reference from the, from, from Loki. the uh, History Channel series, The Vikings? Could be. Could be. If Thor had a hammer, what did Loki have? Uh, Loki has a lot of mascara and a, uh, <laughs> an ability to build boats. Our changelog, new on-body detection, smart lock mode, and Android seems to be hitting some devices. So uh, this is cool. I don't know if you've used this, Jeff, with your... Nexus 6 in your Chromebook, you can unlock your Chromebook just by proximity with your Nexus 6. Yep. It has to have lollipop. Yep. Now, I love it. I love it. now they're extending that. Uh, smart lock mode is called on-body detection. Use your accelerometer to figure out when your device is in your hand or pocket. If it's not Ooh, lock I it. Have it. Do you I have, have it? it? I just saw I have it. If you leave your phone sitting on a table or forget it, it locks. Otherwise, whenever you're using it, it's unlocked. That's how it should happen. After after you act, actively unlock it the first time with your code. Of course. Right. <laughs> it's not like, oh, you picked it up. All right, I'm oh, unlocked oh, now. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so this is Android 5.01 or later. I think we're up to 5.02, aren't we? It's not necessarily 5.01. Uh, yeah, I'm not on 5.1 yet, and I have it, so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Nobody, very few are on 5.1. Well, this is great. Trusted devices, trusted places, trusted face on body detection. Yeah. So the, 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 this is started with the Motorola X, which was cool, which was it knew when you were tied to a trusted device via Bluetooth, it would unlock. That would, and then it had, they had the skip that would unlock it, which was NFC. Now uh, they've added places, so if you're at home, it just stays unlocked. I have that already. Face is facial scan, but I love this on body detection. Keep your device unlocked while it's on you. Just unlock once and your device stays unlocked as long as you keep holding your device. I want fingerprint, by the way. You don't need any of this if you don't have to type a password. If it's just fingerprint, lock it all the time. I don't care. That's one of the great things about the iPhone. I don't, you don't care if it's locked. It's so easy to unlock it. We're doing a mini change lock. Android Auto now available on Android 5.0 Plus and Pioneer head, head ends and units. Android Device Manager now lets you find your lost phone using your Android Wear watch. That's cool. Yep. You could beep the phone from the watch. You could you could always do the watch from the phone, right? Right. right. Now you can go the other way around. Motorola adds a new gesture for the Moto X. It's in Android 5.1. Huh huh. Chop twice for flashlight. Huh huh. Uh, Jeff. Huh huh huh. You have to go, huh? But you go, ah, 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 twice for flashlight. See, I don't like that. I don't want the flashlight to be too easy to turn no, on. I don't. I hate yeah. it when that happens. Remember we when we had the uh, one plus one, uh, yeah. uh, Jason Allen. It would just turn on your pocket. Yep. Suddenly my pocket's getting really warm. Like what's Bad going on? <laughs> yep. Uh, and now Canary is using uh, the successor to Speedy. Should be called Speedier, but it's called HTTP2. I thought Speedy was a better acronym. So if you are on the Canary channel of your Chrome, and if you're not, you can easily do that going into your Chrome settings. You'll get support for the final draft of HTTP2. I don't know how 
how many sites yet support that, but apparently it makes it. Steve's talked a lot about it on security now. How if you want to know how it works, and so forth. But apparently it makes a difference. Um, no, I don't know. I don't think we're. <laughs> I don't think we're speedy. <laughs> we're sluggo. But sluggo, sluggo uh, adapt. Cyanogen. Wow. 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 Turned out Microsoft. Remember? What? Remember a few months ago on this show, I said I'm not crazy about how Cyanogen is going after Google. Why are they going after? Yeah. Google? They got a gift from Google, yeah. and they raised money from Microsoft. Are they going to get money from <coughs> Rupert Murdoch? Well, it turns out they didn't get money from Microsoft. Money from that Microsoft. was uh, that was a mistake. Right. But they did in their Series C round get uh, eighty million <laughs> from Twitter Ventures, Qualcomm. Of course, they use Qualcomm chips. They're working with Telefonica. Smart friend, those are both uh, international telecom companies, and Rupert Murdoch. Murdoch. Mm -hmm. See Murdoch. previous discussion. Values them at half a billion dollars. It is, of course, a version of Android stripped of Google services. I don't know if that's really accurate. Without Google services, I don't think you really want to use any version of Android. And Cyanogen, at least on the OnePlus One, has Google services. But when you okay, now actually, if they think about it, when you download the ROM, if you put a custom recovery on your on your Android device, and you download the ROM, the ROM Cyanogen does not include Google services, but there's always a checkbox that says, oh, by the way, you're going to probably want Google services. Yeah, you have to install. At separately. least the last time I had to do it, yeah, it was in, it was separately the Google Apps kind of package. Services not separate. Yeah, the G apps. Uh, the G yeah, the gaps. That's why, if you've ever wondered why, because it's uh, it's an open source uh, AOSP version of, uh, but nobody wants it. Tencent Holdings is another investor. It's the Chinese That's the Chinese. Chinese. Yeah. yeah. Well, Go get Google. Go get them. Now I think you're right, Jeff Jarvis. Maybe that's what they're uh, up to. Yes, I energy is becoming the anti-Google, but the, which you know, fine, fine. Competition is good. I, I wouldn't mind a whole other operating system. But the funny thing is, they're building the anti-Google on top of Google. Yeah, it just seems it just seems it's weird. Rude. Worked for it's Amazon. Rude. Worked for Amazon. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't it? Didn't. <sighs> Amazon Unlocked will give away paid apps for free. Well, they're already giving away paid apps, but this is more than this one is like day. a subscription service. Oh, something similar to like, like Amazon Prime or something yeah, like yeah. that. Where so you have a Kindle service, like where you, can use, <laughs> you know, the uh, deli Amazon's delivery drones, the one they famously uh, showed uh, on uh, 60 Minutes. Uh, they just got FAA approval to test them. Except, except the drone that they got approval to test has been retired. <laughs> and Amazon. Uh, <laughs> what it, you wanted the FAA to move fast? It's what. It's what they said. They said they. Uh, one of their uh, uh, top executives told a congressional committee yesterday that it's like, yeah, you guys move way too slow. We already like we're done with that drone. Now we have a new drone which is not approved, and we wish you guys would. Uh, Approve these things faster. So, so the so the FAA did actually come out with a new ruling, so that under 200 feet uh, during daylight hours, within visual range, you can now, if you have an exception, pre-standing, you can just go and, and test it. But Amazon's saying that's not good enough. We're going to test in the UK because our whole point is we need to be able to fly drones. If I can see where it's going, see. I can just bring you exactly. the thing. Exactly. The whole point of what we're testing is all of our algorithms and software that enables line it to sight. fly without line of sight. So anyway, so the FAA is still a dinosaur of a, uh, and they're still holding back U.S. Do you come down on that? You, do you want the sky filled with Google drones? Yes, uh, you know the, yes. The, the U.S. has a, a very large sky. What Amazon is proposing is to, you know, they don't want to crash their expensive test drones either, and what they're proposing is uh, is to test drones on a giant piece of private property in a remote wilds of Washington well, State. I don't care if they test them, but, they, but when they roll them out, are they going to be on giant swaths of property on Washington State? Or are they going to be downtown Petaluma? But well, first of all, I don't think that they're going to be a mainstream way to deliver things. But I do think that they'll ah. be useful for delivering emergency supplies. In other words, That's they fine. will save lives. I love that. Right. Yeah. I, I just think and that they have, drones have been used that way. I think if a problem emerges, we should deal with that problem. Yeah. But so far, we ban the commercial use of drones and we allow the private use. And it's the private use. It's the private citizens who are crashing drones into the White House and right. doing all this mayhem. <laughs> and so, so we're ignoring the actual part of the problem while banning something that has never happened as a problem. It just it seems irrational to me. And you know, if it becomes a problem, we can just shoot them out of the sky. Shoot them out of the sky. Get a free exactly. drone. 
There, uh, by the way, people are perfecting new uh, forms of uh, drone uh, destructing, like a bean bags that you can shoot. So it doesn't hurt the drone; it just takes it down. And then you got it. You got a new drone and whatever they were delivering. Maybe a net, like a Spider-Man net. A net. Uh -oh. NFL will be broadcasting one game this season on the internet instead of on direct TV uh, and everywhere uh, else. It is the game that the only reason they're doing this is because it's a game that takes place at 6 a.m. Uh, West Coast time, 9 a.m. East Coast time. It's the Jacksonville Jaguars Buffalo's Bills game in week seven that is in London. <laughs> 9.30 in the morning in uh, the East Coast, which is, of course, where the Bills and the Jaguars play, but uh, yeah, I'm not, you know. Not exactly the Super Bowl. Yeah, and I feel like it's not, I'm not sure what they're doing here with this. Um, it's a bu publicity stunt. It's a publicity stunt. Nobody's going to watch this game anyway, so they might as well. <laughs> this is one they could throw away. Um, oh, oh, this really peeved me a bit. You know, Radio Shack has gone uh, belly up. They're selling off the assets. Uh, the stores are going to uh, Sprint, and some are going to go to Amazon. But, you know, and this is what people always talk about when they talk about privacy policies. Yeah, sure, you can trust company A, the current company, but what if something goes wrong and they sell their assets? Radio Shack wants to sell tens of millions of email and home addresses. These are the ones they gathered when you joined the Battery Club. Or yeah. <laughs> They always ask for your phone number, remember that, at yep. Radio Shack? Well, you thought maybe you could trust Radio Shack. Well, 13 million email addresses, 65 million customer names and physical addresses. And by the way, the company that irritated me every damn time asking me for my phone number when I wanted to buy a battery. Right. And giving me hell when I didn't. Well, it turns out that was an asset. Yep. AT&T is trying to stop the data sale in Texas. It's a violation of state law to sell identifying information if the company's privacy statement says it won't do it. So the attorney generals of uh, attorneys general for Texas and Tennessee plan to challenge the uh, repurchase. Part part of the ra legal rationale behind this is I've, I've been through this with companies with, with with takeovers and stuff. Let's say that oh I don't know Amazon had bought Radio Shack, then the privacy policy is written such that you could pass over the data to a third party, such as an acquirer. And in this case, it's an acquirer, right? It's out of bankruptcy, and but it's not clearly what was intended by a decent privacy policy. I also love the fact that AT&T is trying to stop the Radio Shack sale of consumer data <laughs> yeah, because people. he says, that's ours, that's not yours. That's, it's no, yeah, I should make it clear. I'm not doing it to defend you. Exactly. They're just afraid that Sprint will get the information. They don't want anybody else to get it. That's our data. And uh, I think this is actually a good, it might even be a good uh, tip. Um, thanks uh, to, uh, is it Gary Judge? Oh, yeah, that one, yes, yes. His Headspace a blog, he showed uh, Jeff how to put Skype on his Chromebook. Um, so easy, even I could do it. Yeah, and I think that the trick is that it's possible, you know, it's not that Skype suddenly runs in the browser, or we're not using Crouton and installing Skype on Linux, but it's impossible using an extension called Twerk to run Android apps. Twerk's an Android emulator. I'm going to put it on my Chromebook. I haven't tried it yet. I was going to yeah. actually call you with it today. And so let me do it. So this is crazy because you first have to install Evernote. I don't know why. That's really easy. It's easy. Twerk is dependent upon the app runtime for Chrome that Evernote installs. Then you install Twerk. Then you get the Skype APK because you're going to sideload this. Drag the APK. I don't. I guess you could get that from the Skype site. I don't know where you get it. Well, the link's right there. You included the link. Yeah, okay, but... Let me just see where that link comes from. Uh, it comes from his website. So, just a word of warning, when you get APKs from a third-party site, you don't know what the hell you're getting. Uh, I'm not saying this, you know, that this yeah. guy is not uh, completely on the up and up, but that's kind of the issue. Remember that checkbox you check that says, yeah, do not, I, I want to download uh, apps right. from third parties? Let's face it, the worst case scenario is you'll get Skype. <laughs> that's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, Twerk, though, is available in the Chrome store, so that's presumably okay. You'll install the APK to Twerk. You'll do some settings. Uh, you save it as an unpacked extension, which you then install as an extension into Chrome. Jeez, Jeff. Every time you open it, you have to go over Can you do me a favor, Jeff? <laughs> yeah. Just keep using the Mac. 
<laughs> when I'm out of town now, when I'm out of town now, we can try this. I bet you that there are a lot of people who uh, would really like to play Clash of Clans or whatever on their Pixel. And so, do you think this slows it down? No. It's going through an emulator. No. No. It's Chrome. Your Chromebook, especially the Pixel, is so much faster than the, yeah. Than anything. You're fine. In fact, you probably run better. Well, the good news is you can do this. The nice thing about a, a Chromebook is you can power wash it after you do it if you don't feel at all uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, but that's just a word of warning. Side-loading uh, APKs is just tricky. All right, let me give you a final uh, word from our sponsor, and then we'll get our tip, tool, and number, and we'll let you all hit the road. I've used BlueStacks, which is an emulator, and I, don't, I didn't find it was very good. So I don't know if it's better. Our show today brought to you by, but I'll tell you because I'm going to do it when I get home tonight. Brought to you by HipChat. We use HipChat now. We, we started using it with our developers in Austin, Texas, the web developers. That's the problem. Uh, uh, you get a lot in of, touch with them if they have a question, if there's something to stop them. I'm always on HipChat because it runs on everything Android, iOS, Windows, Macintosh, everywhere. Uh, in fact, if you're, running, if you're running on a Pixel, for instance, you're running on a Chromebook, you could, they have a web interface that works beautifully. So you, suddenly now you're communicating. Now you may say, well, this, this looks like an instant messenger. No, 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 it's so much more. It integrates uh, 57 services like Jira and GitHub and Zendesk, MailChimp, Heroku, which is great for developers, but it's also great for people who need product management services. Email is, you know, is asynchronous and slow. If you, I, I don't, you know, if a team's working over email, I think that's not ideal. Uh, instant Messenger alone is just kind of not designed for this. You're getting video chat. You're getting document sharing, screen sharing, code sharing. Um, this is this is great. It, you know, uh, the, the web developers at Four Kitchens, are, they're an agile house. So uh, the whole, I mean, you know, meetings every day they really want to be able to uh, iterate very rapidly so being in constant communication is great so we're using HipChat now with our engineering team our sales team and on tech news today I we, see you have one for yeah, every show every show because we have a different call anchor every single day oh that makes sense yeah so so we have a we have a Monday one Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday that we have one for TN2 we have one you for know, the I gotta, department in general there is a way to share a uh, HipChat chat with somebody outside your organization and yep. restrict what they can see. It's really great. You can it's send also, a URL. It's SSL. Uh, it's completely locked down, completely secure. And if you want to even trust no one encryption, you can actually run the HipChat server in your enterprise. So now you've really, I just think this is so great. Just fabulous. Now, there is a freemium version you can use forever. But for the next 30 days, I want to get you the full version of HipChat. That includes all the, you know, the videos sharing, the screen sharing. So. That's free. You don't need to give us a credit card. Just go to hipchat, H-I-P-C-H-A-T dot com slash twig. Uh, sign up, click start chatting, invite some team members, and you're in. You've got 30 days to enjoy it. And I'll tell you a little secret. If you're one of the first 100 people to respond to this particular ad, right now, you got to, I don't know how long it takes to get those first 100 signups, but I would do it right now. You'll get 90 days, three months free. Run, don't walk, to hipchat dot com slash Twig, 90 days free for the first hunter. It's really good. It's really, really useful. Uh, um, I don't have a tool. Re Actually, I do have a, well, I have a few tools, because now I'm, I'm a big Chromebook user, Jeff. Whoa, you got some Chromebook tools? I'll, I'll go for that. I'm loving. Give me some, give me some Chromebook loving. Well, a lot of the stuff that I do on Chromebook is probably not something you would necessarily need, although you're a writer. So, um, you know, one of the things that's really great about uh, uh, the Chromebook is it's basically Chrome. So when you install an extension on the Chromebook, it installs it uh, globally on uh, Chrome, which is really handy. And uh, Chrome has its, uh, its little... Um, uh, app. I don't know, Leo. I don't know. Google should be a search company. You're, you you're starting to win browser. me over. No, hey. You shouldn't have this computer. I don't know, Leo. No, you're right. It shouldn't. <laughs> but since it does, I'm going to use it. <laughs> I wish somebody else were doing this. Where's my app drawer? I don't see it. Am I running some weird forgot what, what machine are you on? I'm on the Macintosh. Where's my... Well, it's, 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 it's a, a Windows. Oh, it's weird. Where'd it go? 
Or the upper go. left usually. Yeah, it usually is. Well, there should... it is, there it is, there it is. Where? Apps. Where? Left. Up top left. I'm pointing, I'm pointing to the screen. Like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on the bookmark bar. Thank you. No. Um, there it is. So this on a Chromebook shows up as a like your start menu, which is really nice. And you can see I'm starting to load it up. I use CIRC for our uh, chat room. I use Secure Shell to log into my uh, my uh, Linux server and use Emacs because I'm just that kind of guy. I use Authy for uh, the authentication. Authy's great because it syncs across all of your devices. You should use Floating Twit. It's one of my favorites. Floating Twit. Floating Twit gives you a, a Twit uh, window of live.twit.tv. You can expand it to any size. Wow. Whatever. Now this is a programmer's uh, tool that a lot of uh, where we're to go. Hey, come back here. A lot of programmers will like. It's called Carrot. It's free. Uh, some viewers sent it to me, but I think Jeff, even you might use it. It's kind of the ultimate text editor. The reason programmers like it because it does syntax and it does. It's based on the Sublime text editor. So if you've used Sublime as a programmer, you'll know it immediately. It gives you access to the f file structure on the Chromebook. So suddenly you're kind of using the Chromebook like a <laughs> real computer. Uh -huh. Um, so I've, I've been very happy uh, with this. And, uh, and and as always, when you install something on your Chrome, uh, oh. it appears in Chrome everywhere, which I really like. Yeah. I, I now have a set of tools on all the computers I use, if I can only find the, the, the bar. <laughs> um, and that, that's just really handy. So this is somebody, somebody sent me a note, because I, I talked about one of the few things I can't really do very well on, on, the, on the Pixel, which is, is computer programming. And uh, Carrot is very cool. There's also a site, and I'll add this too as a bonus, called Code Anywhere. It's kind of the same idea. It's designed uh, for people who are on a Chromebook. Actually, let me go to the front page, just the login page. Code Anywhere is a cloud-based programming environment. So it allows you to do collaboration. It'll work just great in any HTML5 browser. And of course, that means on a Chromebook. You have cl uh, cloud storage of your software. Um, you can work with others, which is great for team programming or pair programming. And they have dev box stacks, which is nice. So you can pick the language you want, and and then suddenly on a Chromebook, you're actually it looks like you're you're really programming. Very affordable. I thought this was very cool. And there is a free uh, trial. It's, uh, most of you probably want to spend seven bucks a month if you're going to use this. So carrots free. And it's local, uh, but if you want to do cloud programming on Python, Angular, Node, uh, Ruby, that kind of thing, sports GitHub, codeanywhere.com. Oh, so what, what do you lose with that? What? What? Oh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Chiefly, what you lose is REPL, oh. which is uh, I. That's something I like. It's a great way to learn. Professionals don't care, but the idea that you can um, uh, do a uh, what does REPL stand for? Uh, uh, I can't remember. Parse and, parse and list are the last two. Print and list. Anyway, it allows you to, it's an interpreter. So you can add, you can work in the uh, language, whether it's Python or Ruby or uh, uh, a Lisp. You can work in the language in an interactive uh, box. And that's something you can do on a desktop. You can't really do it on Pixel. Right. You could do it remotely. I actually can. It's one of the reasons I've been using Emacs on SSH is because there's a racket REPL. That's enough of that. Jeff, your number. Uh, well, first I want to give a shout out. So uh, somebody shouted me out the street. I was walking down the street. Hey, and, uh, Jeff Jarvis. Pete Lasanti. Hey, Pete. Uh, Jeff. Hey, Jeff Jarvis. Hey. And, and, and it's just it's, it's my favorite one. Jesus, it was on a rotten day, and it makes it a great day. And so thank you, Pete. You know, thank you, Twink fans. Uh, I, I, you know, I see this when I was in um, Atlanta at the Atlanta airport. After I see somebody, somebody says, "Oh, did I, did I just see Jeff Jarvis at the airport. Come up and say hello." I love it. It's two seconds. It's great. Um, uh, I think it's the greatest thing on earth. Um, thank you. Because no one has ever asked for an autograph. They, they must ask you. Uh, occasionally. Yeah. So of course, now it's not the autograph. Autographs are dead, right? Pictures. Oh, everybody wants a selfie. Do you Ooh. get that? Oh yeah. Yeah, but you do. But you do. Not a lot. All right. I not get as much, much as you do. No, 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 I don't get it at all. It's fine. They don't want a um, selfie? With somebody on the street? No. <laughs> That's embarrassing. REPL stands for Read Evaluate Print, Read Eval Print Loop. Thank you. Oh, I guess I'll go with this one. Uh, MIT Data Storage Researcher wins the Alan Turing Award, which is $1 million from Google. Michael what? Stonebreaker 
So maybe Google, Google funded Elliot? the Turing Award uh, as a kind of um, Nobel or Pulitzer of uh, technology. Eight. And you remember that Yuri Milner also has a, an award for um, physicists and theoretical scientists. Yeah. And so his efforts to, to reward. Because some of these people, you know, you, you look at the, the, the Tim Berners Lees of the world who, who changed the entire world and didn't get rich from it per se. I, mean, I hope he's got good gigs since, including MIT. Um, so uh, Stonebreaker did foundational research in database management systems, an industry now worth billions. And so here's a here's a million dollar uh, shekel for you. Uh, and I think it's I think it's very cool that Google does that. Uh, he was at MIT's again, uh, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, and he uh, founded multiple successful database companies. Wow, a million schmackers! Yeah, it used to be an Intel. Or Google uh, did it together. It was a two hundred fifty thousand dollar prize, but then Google took it over and made it a, a round. They rounded up. He founded nine separate companies. Nine. That's a busy boy. Volt DB Tamer Paradigm Four Vertica. <coughs> nice million dollars. Your number of the week. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Now, did you uh, have anything, uh, Mr. Mike Elkin, you'd like to pass along to our fine twig? I do. Yes. Today, at uh, during the F8 conference, you and I were lamenting the fact that Facebook has a tendency to come along with a copycat, something or other. Right. Long after it's been discredited, or long after it's been around, can't remember the name of most of them. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, yesterday they announced a new feature called "On This Day," and the way that works is, if you, you can, if you have it already, and they're, they're rolling it out over the next week, but if you have it, it's at Facebook.com/slash On This Day, and what it does is it shows you things that either you posted on this day in a previous that's year, cool. or that when it's time somebody tag, exactly. So that's my that's my. Um, and, and so on this day is for Facebook only. Uh, so my pick of the week is to remember Time Hop. I now, love Time Hop. Time Hop pulls from not just Facebook, but also Twitter, Instagram, Foursquare, Flickr, Dropbox, Google, iPhoto, and even your camera roll. And it will show you uh, things that you that were posted on this anniversary and from previous years. It's a lot of fun. And it's everything that on this day is and much, much more because it pulls from so many different things. This was originally... Uh, a uh, Foursquare app from a Foursquare contest. Oh, yeah, it was called, I think the original name was something like Foursquare and Seven Days Ago or something like that. That was the name of the app. Uh, <laughs> but, but nowadays, Time Hop is available for both Android and iOS. You just download it, you connect it to your different social networks, and it will just remind you of how quickly life is passing you by. I mean, it'll show you stuff that happened a year ago or two years ago, and you're like, really? Really? It seemed like it was two months ago. Anyway, it's it's a lot of fun. It's very enjoyable to use. And, uh, you know, forget about that Facebook uh, uh, copy on this day and just use time. Yeah, I agree. It's great for Throwback Thursday. Yes. Because exactly. you've, you've always got some images you can throw. And if you're like me and you go to Facebook.com slash on this day, it says, Leo, thank you for coming to check out your memories. Currently, this feature isn't available. You have no memories. I have no memories. Because you canceled your Facebook account. I'm going to cancel it now, let me tell you. Thank you, Mike Elgin. It's always great to have you. He's our news director, guy in charge of our news coverage. Does such a great job every Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 1700 UTC on Tech News Today. That's right. Uh, and you can also catch him tomorrow uh, a little earlier, 9 a.m., right? You're going to start right, an hour a.m. again, yes. And, of course, you can always subscribe to Tech News Today on the app, the podcast app of your choice. So. Yeah, and then following it tomorrow, we're going to do F8. That's right, virtual reality tomorrow. Tomorrow's yeah. going to be the fun one, I think. That's what that's what we're hoping. Yeah. Couldn't be Did less anything fun. today make you say ooh? Uh, made me say ew. Oh, well played, well well played, my friend. Yeah, I can't think of one thing that Facebook yeah. announced yesterday today that made me go like yeah. I want that. And I and I, and I tried because. Uh, in fact, I even apologized during our uh, special. This is a Twit Live special if you want to watch it. Um, that I, I didn't mean to be snarky and negative, but I couldn't find anything to say. Oh, that's great. I can't wait to get that. Everything was been there, done that. The spherical yeah. video, the, you know, all of it. Yeah. It was just... They don't... They don't... Yeah. They don't seem to be good at inventing new things. And yet they did, and they are, and they're smart. And uh, Apple's done fine not inventing new things, just refining existing things. But Facebook... Everybody just goes, eh. 
That's nice. Show me pictures of my cat. Jeff Jarvis is at the City University of New York. CUNY, they call it. He's also on uh, Google Plus, as is Mike. Both of these guys are big Google Plusers. Are you at all in any way feeling like I should put less on Google Plus? It's a public page. If you if you post to public, it's like having your own website, yeah. even if you don't have engagement. If you do have engagement, it it's like all, Google's it's really into it anymore. It's really frustrating. You know, this whole Meerkat thing, which I know you're fed up with, okay? Uh, why didn't they do this three and a half years ago yeah. and just make Hangouts on Air or something you could do from a mobile They were device? so close, weren't they? Yeah. But uh, it, it is frustrating, and I wish they would do a lot more, And um, but it's still a bazillion well, Bradley's, times Bradley's Facebook. in charge now. Let's see what he does. Yeah, that's a good point. I love Brad. Yep. He's yeah, cool. I love Brad. Jeff also has written, authored many great books. He blogs at buzzmachine.com. Get that geek sparing gifts. That's about... The news industry. It's yeah. wonky. It's wonky. It's for news wonks. It's if you know what how we can reinvent news in the in the internet world. Uh, but I think a lot of what you talk about is happening, which is good. Um, and um, we do this show every. It's kind of my last show of the week, so I'm always a little glazed by this time of day. <laughs> every Wednesday, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 2000 UTC, at. Uh, live.twit.tv. If you want to watch live, we love that. You can be in our chat room, irc.twit.tv. Uh, but you can also get on-demand audio and video at twit.tv slash twig or iTunes or, you know, any of your podcatchers, Overcast or Pocket Cast or Dogcatcher, whatever it is that you, you like to use. We also have great apps, thanks to our independent third-party developers. We don't do any ourselves, but they've done a great job. And uh, you should find those apps on iOS, Android, Windows Phone, Roku, Somebody, I received a number of emails that we are no longer listed on TiVo. TiVo, which is a small, relatively small platform, has its own podcast section. And I guess not never were all our shows listed there, but a few were. And apparently TiVo has pulled them down. You can manually enter RSS into that, although I don't know who would want to do that. And I apologize to those of you who watch us on TiVo. I have no idea. We never... Tebow never asked us ahead of time. They never told us they were pulling us down. We didn't. We didn't even. We don't even really know anybody at Tebow. Tom Rogers. Well, Patrick Delahanty in our uh, our programming department has uh, in our engineering department says he is in touch with Tebow about getting it back. It's a weird thing. I don't know what happened. If you have problems, let me know. I'll leave you know somebody over there? there? I know the CEO. You know what would help? Try first, and if you have a problem, um, you know, I, I complained on Twitter once about a broken depot box, and bingo, Tom was there fixing it. He came to your house? Well, yeah. With yeah. a screwdriver? Yeah. That's yeah, nice. a button crack. That's service. Uh, I am a TiVo Romeo Pro user. I love my TiVo. I've sold the world on TiVos, so I'm somewhat mortified that TiVo doesn't like me back. All right, well, we'll keep that in mind, and if Patrick doesn't have any success, we'll let you know. Let me know. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Twig. Bye bye. Bye bye. Does any does anybody have live streams on TiVo? That'd be nice. You no, know, it's weird because I don't. You know, it must be just some cl guy in a closet that does this <laughs> because, like the the feature. But the thing is, it carries a lot of weight because there's the bar of what you could watch now, which is like The Good Wife, NFL football, and then there's always a podcast on there. Yeah. And it's like the Wood Whisperer, which is a great podcast, Mark. I love you, but why the Wood Whisperer, and, and why never any one of ours? I don't know. It seems odd. So, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. I did write thank books you. on TiVo, but I wrote books on hacking TiVo, which may be one go. of the reasons. <laughs> now we know. That was a long time ago. I was young, and I needed the money. See ya, Jeff. See ya. Have a good one. Bye, Jeff. Thank you. Take Bye, care. Jeff. Tomorrow's Leonard Nimoy's 84th birthday. Uh, mm, I can't imagine that the vast number of people who watch us on TV. Certainly even less now. Yeah. I just, it could be a lot because if, you know, it's literally they have this thing, recommendations in the interface, and there's always a podcast on the last one that downloaded was March 21st Tech Guy. So you can, and that's the other thing, you can create a season pass and you can automatically get shows. Well, but he didn't get any shows from this week. That was the last show he got. He said, uh, Crimson says he has a season, or she has a season pass for most all Twitch shows. And the last one that she got was the Tech Guy from Sunday. 
Or no, that's Saturday. The Facebook disc. Well, I, yeah, Apple TV just pulls from the iTunes. Uh, <laughs> we will. That's a I, lot of work to so make a little tree. TiVo. We are going to work very hard once we have this new site, which we will in a month or so, with the API. We're going to work very hard to get mobile versions of all our stuff there that are really usable, and the API is going to be great. It's going to be very useful. We're on the media browser for Windows Media Center. Okay. Ten minutes. Lots of questions. Robin just took the uh, survey. Thank you, Robin. And so 10 minutes, that's not too bad. Not too bad. Totally worth it. Yeah. I started, but I got bored. <laughs> when it asked me how many shows I listened to, and I said, only the ones I'm on. And only while I'm And only while talking. I'm doing them. Dee, 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 dee. All right. Uh, let me do, uh, I need a title. Get some good candidates. <laughs> on fire TV. So the issue is really, I mean, uh, we're going to we, 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 uh, uh, we're going to have Craig do a iOS app immediately. But then we need to find uh, developers on other platforms. And uh, and we want you to use the, we're going to have a style guide and we want you to use the API. So there'll be somewhat of a uniformity across the apps. And we're not going to discourage or prevent in any way people doing third party apps. And what we'd like to do is encourage our third party developers to use the API. We should hire that so much guy to put our all, shows on all platforms look, automatically. Yes, automatically. On, TiVo. If you use Chrome, you've got Twit. That would be good. Yeah. be good. That's our data. That's our data. Uh, yeah, there is a Twit on Fire TV. Is that Mark's? I can't remember. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, yeah, Robin, we know that we don't give you every possible way that you could watch those sh the shows or listen to the shows. You can just use other when A lot of people said, oh, you, but you know how long that list would be if we... <laughs> I, not, I don't know why they chose whatever they chose, but... Uh, the SDK for Windows 10 came out. That's good. Mark Hansen does a very good job, actually. His uh, app for uh, Android is excellent, too. Uh, I use uh, Houdini's for uh, iOS, Mark's for Android, Dimitri Leallen's for uh, Windows Phone, uh, Craig Houdini, said that Craig Mulaney did the uh, Roku app. But all of the apps will be better because the apps to, to, to date, the only way that they can get the information is by scraping or using the RSS feed, which, yeah. so we gave them very little useful information. Now, oh, it's such a rich API. You can, you know, you can do all sorts of stuff. You can create new new feeds. You can do all sorts of stuff. It's really nice. Yeah, Twit Pro. I think that's Mark Hansen's. <laughs> yeah, Molly Wood left the Times to go to Marketplace. Marketplace, which is, I think, a great move on her part. Yep. Love Marketplace. Uh, so yeah, congrats to Molly on that. Twitcast is also Mark Hansen's. That's his Chromecast app. Yeah. There are not any official Twit apps yet. I think actually technically the Roku app is official. We paid to have it. Still need... Oh, you know another great thing? I'll give you another tip. Our new player, our new web player, is going to be JW Player, and it supports Chromecast. So you'll be able to Chromecast... He's from a browser. From, from a browser. 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 And I awesome. presume that would be on any size platform, including <coughs> Android. So, so the there will the the website will look nice and mobile. Tune in Radio Pro. That's a great way to listen. Shoot the drone, beanbag drone, drone things that make you go ew. Oh, what was that? That was a good one. Uh, ooh, you not ooh. Yeah, Jeff said I could say you not ooh. You not ooh. <laughs> you not ooh. Do you want to play Monopoly? You not ooh. Ooh not. You not ooh. Did you owe? No, I you'd. <laughs> uh, Facebook disc. The Facebook disc.
disk like that. There were I gotta start writing these down because there's a couple floated by and I was thinking, oh that's a good title and I didn't write it down. Was, so I never remember it. You yet. see it go by and oh that's cool. That's a good one. Uh, uh, I was young and I needed the money. <laughs> Selfies with Jeff. Jelfies. That's our data. Ooh, you have an at t Note 4, Dr. Mom? I have an unlocked Note 4 with the, it's the uh, South Korea, no, where is mine from? China. Oh, it's the Hong Kong Note 4. And I haven't got a 5 yet. I'm dying for lollipop. I'm dying for it. The Google Cocoon. That's our data. The Battery Club. Yeah, I know. Nothing's, uh, need a succinct. It's hot in here. Is it, is it hot out there? Just Why is it hot, hot here? in here? I'm sweating. 75 degrees in here? What do you think this is, Florida? It's nice. I like it. I like it to be 70 at the most. If it's 71, I go, it's hot in here. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I can be comfortable at 75. 70, okay. <laughs> Things that make you go, it's you. we're all having hot flashes. It's hot out here, too. From ooh to you? Yeah, I'll do ooh to you. From ooh to you? Yeah. Something like that. Um, Was it an ooh? No, an you. <laughs> this is Twig, This Week in Google, episode 293, recorded Wednesday, March 25th, 2015. You, not ooh. This Week in Google is brought to you by LegalZoom. It's National Start Your Business Month at LegalZoom and the best time to create the business you've always dreamed of. LegalZoom is not a law firm, but they can connect you with an independent attorney. <laughs> This week at Google is brought to you by LegalZoom. It's National Start Your Business Month at LegalZoom, and it's the best time to create the business you've always dreamed of. LegalZoom's not a law firm, but they can connect you with an independent attorney. Visit LegalZoom.com and use the offer code TWIG in the referral box to save even more. And by HipChat. Collaborate, save time, and be more productive with your teams. HipChat is I am video chat plus file, code, and screen sharing all in one place. Invite your team members and get a free 30-day trial of the full version of HipChat at hipchat.com slash twig. It's time for Twig this week at Google. Jeff Jarvis is here. Mike Elgin joins us. We're going to talk about the FTC investigation of Google from a couple of years back. Turns out it wasn't as cut and dried as we thought. A big debate ahead on This Week in Google. Okay. All right. Thank you, Michael Elgin. You, Leo. It is my Friday. We're going to... Does did Lisa want to do a uh, inside twit? I saw her come out. Today's my Wednesday. <laughs> You're a weirdo. It feels like a Wednesday. It was like a Wednesday. Do you want to do an inside twit next week? All right. We got nothing to say, but uh, just a reminder, April 19th, we are now sold out. We have now uh, had enough responses that we want to leave, I think it's 65. We don't want to exceed that number because there's that's not including staff. And it's 24 hours, right? You're gonna no. <laughs> it's no. Quit it, Mike, quit it. <laughs> no. April 19th is our 10th anniversary. He's never to quit. shaving his head again. I, think I the said it publicly. Kevin Rose, Patrick Norton, David Prager, Robert Heron, the whole gang. Uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun. We're getting director's chairs. Yeah, it's gonna be really cool. That's gonna and be we, great. Uh, so, but uh, I thank you. We didn't expect the response we got. We got already. We're full. Uh, so, uh, if you wish to email tickets at twit.tv, we'll put you on a waiting list. But we won't. Yeah. We due to f you know fire marshal rules, we can't let people in if they don't have a ticket. So please don't just show up. We won't be able to let you in because the place will already be full. Um, so, uh, thank you. And I'm sorry if you put it off, because that's what I do. I usually wait till the week before. 
Fortunately, there's a brisk business on StubHub in scalped tickets. Right, but unfortunately, you married me, so we don't do things last minute. Well, not She's all the time. Planner. I try to. Um, so yeah, but that's great. And but you know, here's the good news: we're gonna stream it live. You can watch it live on TV. And really, if you're in the chat room, Doctor Mom, if you actually showed up, I can make sure you got in. Oh, you can, there, you can have my there, desk. We'll make exceptions for uh, people like Doctor. No, if Robert Redford offered me a million dollars to shave Leo's head, I wouldn't do it. But if he offered me a million dollars to sleep with her, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that a movie? Didn't he do that? I, <laughs> I have no comment. How did the marriage plan work? What do you mean? I don't know what he means. It's his question. How did the marriage plan hey, work? Hey, Bert said, how did the marriage plan work? Yeah, we just snuck off and got married. She snagged me. No, we're very happy. We're so happy. And don't forget, you have to at least watch our 10th anniversary. We have a huge, this is gonna be great. enormous surprise. And yes, we're going to meerkat tonight. Leo's going to um, read to me. Did you hear what I had to ban? I had to ban Jeff. He's now got a steady cam set up. I said, Jeff, stop it. You're on company time. Do not meerkat. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll meerkat. Yes, we have a normal schedule this week. It doesn't matter if it's Passover or Easter. We are actually here. Oh, yeah, we are working, unfortunately. We're working Easter. So we will have... Um, Waffles and I think we have a grill here, so we'll do that again, right? Do we have and in the morning, I'm gonna make waffles. I'm gonna make Leo make waffles before he starts. Let's all spend the night. We'll tell each other stories. And in the morning, I'm gonna make waffles. It's funny. Awesome. Are funny. we ready? You gonna roll to I five? Yep, I got it all lined up and ready. That's funny. Yep, we'll have an Easter egg hunt. Funny how do I amuse you? Like I'm a clown? You get to amuse mm. you? Uh, ball soup and brisket and garlic sauce. That lovely. sounds good. You know, I, I asked uh, Jeff, I said, oh, so you're going to a Seder tonight? He says, not to, for a week. I said, well, why is Dr. Mom cooking her chicken soup now? You start early. No, we don't get Easter off. Yeah, in the uh, in my medical director directive, that's exactly why I got married, so Lisa could pull the plug on me. That's terrible. Well, somebody's got to. Well, you have that authority on me, you too, actually, so... I think if you're not married, you couldn't even come in, right? The room, if I'm dying. Well, you actually are in my medical power of attorney to be the one that makes that, that one? decision. All right. So now I you're officially that person. I have one, but... I have one, because I, I have my one. will. I have I to get my to get will one. updated, too. To yeah, changing your name is a challenge. I just started that process. It's going to take a long time. Uh, finally, I decided not to get my uh, passport because I didn't have hair. So now that I have enough hair to get a passport picture, I will now get the passport. As long as she's listed, she can. Uh, and how do you get her listed? <laughs> if I'm your wife, I make I all your say, decisions. Nowadays, I can't imagine that they would say, oh, you know, you're not legally tied, so you can't. Um, I think we're done. Um, we're I done. Guess I five, baby. All good. All right. I'm going to switch over. Enjoy Bye, the rest of your day. Forward. I'll be back on Saturday with the Tech Guy. <laughs> this is, is Twit. Twit. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit. TV slash survey. This episode of i5 for the iPhone is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, and other Apple products are worth at gazelle.com. Welcome to i5 for the iPhone, episode 135. i5 covers the latest i... That was Twit for today. At least for me. But they keep on sending.
First we straighten it out and then we roughen it up. That's a little weird. But that's how we do it. We have some more tricks we need. I have to go a second. I wanted to have a very 
dense uh, crown canopy or you will call it top but I also want it to look a little in the winter look a little scary You can keep turning it and see new things all the time. New small errors. But <clears throat> we are only making one of these trees here. Because you would immediately, <clears throat> sorry, immediately uh, recognize it if you paint, and there were two of them. That's why. That's why we made a lot of those anonymous uh, one as 
pill three. Luger likes more or less. what I was listening what I was listening to tonight that was Twit live podcast tech podcast Windows Weekly and uh, Google Show I will stop for now because this will take many hours to upload and I'm tired and it's midnight here. Thank you for viewing and hope I'll see you again.